I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. It's interesting. Experiences, I think, are more valuable than money. So in every case, so whether you're trying to build a brand, mm -hmm. like being very capitalistic about it, you're trying to build some brand thing or some effect, it's always worth it to lose money on those if the experience is good and correct and, and, and you know you're going to get fans and, and whatever from it. And if it's fun for you. Yeah, yeah. My, my philosophy is always follow my curiosity, my enthusiasm, and can I pull it off? And so, okay, so interesting gets noticed by 500 people, extreme gets noticed by 500,000 people. Um, all right, so we're recording. So excited to have Mark Malkoff on the show. I have to say, people might not know the name, but I'm just going to list off a bunch of things, but there's going to be even more things that we'll talk about. You're doing a, a right now, your you're big things, you're doing a podcast on persistence, which is very good, which our producer Steve Cohen has been on. You're doing a podcast on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, mm -hmm. which I want to talk about, but you, you, you worked for Stephen Colbert on the Colbert Report, uh, you've but you've also done all these amazing like I want I like I was telling you earlier they're almost like AJ Jacobs like mini experience like you went and visited you, in one day you visited every single Starbucks in New York City 171 of them and had a beverage in each Starbucks. So just real quickly, did you drink the whole beverage? <laughs> um, no, I don't think I would live to tell uh, about it. But I did. It was I went to. I had to go to a store every seven minutes for twenty three hours straight. It took me a month of training, and I just made a purchase. I didn't drink it every every store, but after twelve hours in the hot July weather on a bike, I couldn't walk in a straight line. My, I, I, I seriously could not. Like friends had to help me. Is that because of the coffee car. or because yes. they were tired? Bo both in the hot. Like I mean, it was like sweltering outside, and it was. It was one of. The, it's funny that you mentioned AJ because I'm friendly. I know I'm friends with AJ and our wives. We were at a party or some function. My wife Christine is here, and her and Julie got together, and they just kind of could, could swap stories. I mean, how many how many wives like can can say my husband did this? And so they kind of got out some yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. And now I know AJ in his books refers to Julie as the Julie the Saint <laughs> yeah. because she gets that a lot. Christine gets that a lot. Because like one time he he even outsourced his arguments with her to an outsourcing firm in India. Yeah. <laughs> so, he, but it's like similar type of things. And so I want to get back to the Starbucks one and kind of the philosophy behind it. But I just want to list some of the other things you've did. Um, you you moved into an IKEA store in Paramus, New Jersey for a week as your apartment was being fumigated. You. Uh, flew on AirTran for 30 straight days. Like, did you leave the plane? I never went into public and I never went into an airport. So I would once in a while, I guess once a day, t would have to go on a tarmac to switch planes. But I had a badge um, in Atlanta where I would always end up where I could walk unaccompanied. So I'd be on the tarmac with my sleeping bag in the morning and a pillow walking to the next plane and security people would come up and say, let me see your badge. And they would just be shocked. That that's, I'd have it. So, uh, that's funny. Yeah. So uh, then... Um, oh, this one I thought was funny where mm. you you wanted to see how many U.S. mayors <laughs> you could convince to hand you over the key to their city. I did something similar once, which I could tell you about in a second, but I just want to keep listing these things. Uh, another time you were contesting the fact that people always say New Yorkers are rude. So starting from the southern end of the island, uh, you, you tried to travel – the distance in New York, how, I don't know how far you got, but uh, you tried to travel the distance where only by strangers carrying you. It was 9.4 9 miles, 19 hours, coldest day of the year. How, how many people carried you? 155. All right, we're going to talk about that. Older people, senior citizens, men and women, young and old. I, I, I love this one, even though this is not uh, this in the same category of experience. You wrote an article, The Will Farrell Curse, where you basically said, uh, Every talk show that had Will Farrell on on as their first guest or on their first day got canceled within a season. I was living on the airplane and I was promoting their Wi-Fi. I was just when airplanes were starting to get Wi-Fi. It was like a huge new thing. And my friend that worked on the Colbert Report, we would always um, talk about insider stuff. And we were emailing and I said, when it was announced that Conan's first guest was going to be Will Farrell, I said to myself, they, this, I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But every time Will Farrell's been a first guest, the show hasn't made it past a year. And obviously this is, a, uh, or not obviously, this is like one of those things where like there's a statistic that when, uh, and maybe Steve knows the exact statistic, when the NFC wins the Super Bowl uh, versus the AFC, the stock market goes up. And if the AFC wins, the stock market goes down. But these are like called spurious, cor you know, Correlations. Do you think that's spurious, or do you think Will Ferrell just damages the show? I think Will Ferrell <laughs> is is so funny and talented, and I think it's just one of those things. It's just I, it's I just don't like know. It's just down from there. It was one of those things where I'm like, you know, I have to be wrong because Will Ferrell, Conan is finally getting the Tonight Show. I have lots of faith in Conan. I was going to the show when he first premiered in September of '93. I went all the time. I believed in him, and I was like, I have to be wrong. But I told my friend, I'm like, they should have gone for like Bill Murray, who Bill Murray always has longevity when people when when he's the first guest, or like a Michael J. Fox, who was John. Stewart's first guest on The Daily Show. Oh, but, um, yeah. yeah. And, and by the way, last, this is not mentioned in here, but last time we were on a plane, all four of us were on a plane, uh, they were playing the documentary about Bill Murray. You, you, you guys are on it. Yes, Christine and myself. I, it was, I did not think about it. I, did, I, I, I wanted to try to get him because he does all these. I was these, surprised. I see. I, yeah. I know that guy. <laughs> It was one of those things where I really want to, I, I have friend, mutual friends with Murray and I had his 800 number, which is so hard to get. And he does all these adventures. And I thought, you know what? I'm, I'm going to do an adventure where I call his 1-800 number maybe once in a while and try to get him to come over to our place. And Christine will and we'll make him dinner and we'll hang out and, and uh, hang out. And um, very quickly, his friends told me, uh, Mark, he doesn't even call us back. So I was like, oh my gosh. And then I heard that Ivan Reitman for Ghostbusters, he wouldn't, and they were friends. Murray wouldn't call Ivan Reitman back until he had Michael Jordan make a phone call and then he called back. You know, I read yeah. in that book, uh, I think there's a book called The Tao of Bill, Bill Murray. Yeah. He, his philosophy is early on in life, he, he saw people who were incredibly wealthy and that they kind of acted like they could do whatever they wanted. He figured he would have in his mind, the, he would almost hypnotize himself to thinking he was amazingly wealthy and he would just act accordingly. And since he, he wasn't wealthy at, at that time, he couldn't buy anything. So the only thing you could do is have ex interesting experience, act as if, you know, 
what would a wealthy person do if they were only having experiences instead of buying things? And it seems like that's how he lives his life. He really does. It's a yes and. I mean, when he's in public and something presents itself, I mean, there was a break dancer. I heard the story and, Mer and somebody was like, uh, Bill, come here. And he just, I mean, it's the second city, yes and. It. The one thing I find fascinating about him is that his he, 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 he does not listen to authority. Any authority figures, if he feels that there is an authority figure and they're trying to uh, move him in a way. It's so he, funny. You can't control that guy. It, it's so funny because that's basically what every single one of his movies are about. <laughs> like, do you think he picks the scripts because it it falls into that category? I think it's that either, either him. I would think Mitch Glazer, his friend for, for decades, who directs him sometimes and maybe reads them. But if not, I think Murray does. And it was one of those things with the 800 number at one point where if you would get a call back, which was very rare. I mean, Sofia Coppola, I don't think, got a call back for like months and months and months for, for translation. And finally, I, I don't know what, how it happened, but she was calling it. So that shows you how hard he is. Murray, I remember one time, he got a call back from somebody that was in Murray's camp that said, you need to leave your screenplay at this corner on this street in a phone booth. That's crazy. So he basically kind of, just what's quirky to him, he just creates. It works. The 800 number absolutely works for him. He, uh, yeah, just this, everything. I mean, when I had a day job at Letterman, uh, I was there when I was 22. He was the only guest that I'm aware of that would not go through the traditional entrance where there would be autograph people and, and photographers. He'd always go in the audience entrance. And it was, it, at one time he, he got there and the pages were like, no, Mr. Murray, this isn't the entrance. He's like, yeah, thank you very much. And he just goes in. He does what he wants to do. That's, I mean, so many like of the great and talented comedians and comedic actors in the past, let's say, 50 years have been like that. Like, think of Andy Kaufman. Like, it sounds very Kaufman-esque to do what you just described. You know, the way he would perform and then he would say, okay, we're all going to go out for donuts. And there would be school buses lined up outside of Radio City Music Hall and he would take everyone to donuts. He lost money on that too. It was one of those things. Is that, this was like his dream to do the Carnegie Hall thing. And it's um, George Shapiro was his manager who's Seinfeld's manager still. And uh, yeah, he Andy actually would lose money on these stunts because it was just the, the dramatic effect. I mean, I don't think he probably made anything going to Memphis and doing the wrestling thing, but it was just all about pulling these crazy things off. Yeah, because well, well, it's it's interesting you bring up, um, you know, he would lose money on it. experiences. I think are more valuable than money. So in every case, so whether you're trying to build a brand, mm -hmm. like being very capitalistic about it, you're trying to build some brand thing or some effect. Mm -hmm. It's 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 always worth it to lose money on those if 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 the experience is is good and correct and 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 you know you're gonna get fans and and whatever from it and if it's fun for you yeah yeah no I think I have, my my philosophy is always follow my curiosity my enthusiasm and can I pull it off and so okay so another one you did you watched like every single movie on Netflix in a month two hundred seventy two movies it was so many mo <laughs> movies and I it was fun for like the first day or two I was watching like between eight and twelve movies. A day and like would he spend mind, time with you, Christine? If I would watch a movie with him, <laughs> <laughs> my mind turned to mush. The, the highlight was Andrew McCarthy doing live commentary on St. Elmo's Fire, and then Netflix found out about it. this. Had nothing to do with Netflix. They found out about it and they started tweeting at me. And then they flew me to Las Go Las uh, where is it Los Gatos to their headquarters. And they had Mark Malkoff day, and I got to meet Re Reed Hastings, and it was like this huge thing, which I didn't expect, but it was one of those things. I want to see what my value would be. I would get the best value for my Netflix subscription. So I think it worked out to like two cents a movie or something at the time. Uh, it's so funny. Christina's and shaking her head. I love do you, you. You know, I don't. I typically don't even remember movies after I watch them. I'm like, did you remember the 270 no, movies? No, because Christine and I would be watching something and be like, this seems vaguely familiar. I'm like, no, no. And then I would have to go on the internet and Google my name and Netflix and then look at the list. And I said, I, I, did, I actually did see North by Northwest. So, <laughs> That's yeah. funny. So, okay. So, so I think I gave a, a rough list of, yeah. of some of the things you're doing. Um, and the, and I kind of want to talk about all of them. So let's just, is it okay we just go yeah, random? Yeah, let's do it. So I like the, where did you get the, it seems like this Starbucks thing in 2007. Oh no, you did something in 2000, after 9-11, you did, you had, you did some interesting thing. What was the thing that you did after 9-11? Oh, with the cabs, you, were, you gave free cab oh, rides. Oh, free cab rides. I wanted to see what that would be like. So I, I had, I found somebody that was a licensed driver because it was, it was to, to get somebody to commit to that, like a, I think it was 12 or 14 hours. And I just, I, th I thought that there would be enthusiasm and there was. So we just went all over the island. Um, people were tweeting for free cab rides. So um, 
Yeah, it was definitely, it was like- the, and You were giving pop, you popcorn to them? Yes. And- yeah, we filled the, the cab with popcorn. I forget. I think at the, we were st- stranded at the um, West Side Highway and I was sunbathing for like maybe 10 minutes. But uh, yeah, it was definitely one of those things where it's, I get the idea and it's like, how can I pull this off? And the execution, you know, the executions, everything. And sometimes I fall on my face, but so many times when people said like the Starbucks thing, people were like, this is impossible. There is no way- that you, somebody could do this. And I just, I, there's something, I mean, Christine was just mentioning this where she's observed this. There's something inside me that, that I was like, I have to, I have to prove so, them wrong. So what happens? Like, like, do you think, what would, like, A, why are you thinking, what would, what would it be like to go to every single Starbucks in New York City? It's just like, my, where does yeah. that thought come from? So like, yeah. you could see like <laughs> a scientist saying, what would it be like to mix this chemical with this <laughs> chemical? This might yeah. cure cancer. You say, what would it be like to go to every single Starbucks in New York City? My, Why? My mind, it's like always curious, always these things. And I remember at Astor Place, two Starbucks, like, I don't know, 50 feet apart, Rockefeller Center, two Starbucks, Macy's, two Starbucks. And it was one of those things with how, how, how many Starbucks are there? I started with that. And people at Starbucks stores, whenever I'd be in there, this was over like a month, they would give me different numbers. I called up the, the Starbucks and they said that they, they, they really didn't know. So I was so obsessed I, with this that uh, I went to every single Starbucks store and, and I counted myself. And because I would call and be like, what are your hours? And they would they would give all different hours. So I, I, I took a month of my life on a scary New York uh, and, and scary traffic on a bike, which I'd never done in New York. And uh, soon I was, I was passing bike messengers. I was so focused on this with, could you make this happen? We tried it with a car actually once and it didn't work. I mean, obviously it didn't work with a car. It would be impossible. So I had to get a director who was a bike pro I had to get my crew members, and they all got sick, by the way. Um, so, so, yeah. so wait, before you did yeah. the day, though, yeah. see, I think a lot of people would stop. Like, the fact that you spent a month, uh, you, as you With say, training. a month of your life just finding out the number yeah, and, that, and the techniques you use. And practicing, going to all the stores and doing dry runs on a bike. But that in itself, yeah. a lot of people would stop and say, okay, this is an article. This is like a, a publishable article. Just every, like, A, the number, and B, uh, all the work you went through to find that number, that by itself is interesting. But then you took it one step further and said, okay, now let's do something. Ex- uh, I just did something interesting. Now let's do something extreme, which is that's good. Interesting gets noticed by 500 people. Extreme gets noticed by 500,000 people. So, so you said, okay, the extreme thing here would not be to visit every Starbucks in a month or a week but a day. Yeah, we did it in 23 hours. And it's one of those things with somebody that said, you can't, there's no way that somebody could do this. And it was- like, is, that the, is that the measure is you say, there's no way somebody can do this? Like a month, you could picture somebody doing. Yeah, that would be too easy. I mean, it's something, there is something that like Christine and I did a project for this charity, Afia, which is incredible. They take um, surplus medical supplies and ship them to places like Puerto Rico and Africa. And they wanted me to do a stunt video where I volunteered for something like 24 to 48 hours. And I was like, it has to be 48 to get attention. And one of my friends, who's a good friend of mine, is like, can you really do that? I'm like, can I do that? And then I said, I've done this, this, and this. But before that, he said that, I was like questioning. I was like, I don't think I can do this. I take naps. I've only stayed up 24 hours like twice, but we stayed up 52 hours. And there is something when people say that to me where I just get really focused uh, and I get in this this zone and everything, all my thoughts are about pulling this thing off. And then and then you had you decided, okay, to film it. Yeah. Uh, so are, have you always been interested in, I mean, obviously you're interested in TV, like you're doing a podcast with The Carson Show, you've worked for Stephen Colbert, yeah. you worked uh, on The Letterman Show. Um, so you've done a lot of things with TV. Was your idea, t- like it almost sounds like you can make a TV show called Mark Does Stuff <laughs> and every month you're just doing, or every week you're just doing some crazy thing. like. Yeah, I, the endless like ideas about three by five cards with stuff I want to do. But it's like when somebody, want their enthusiasm and they have a vision. I remember two of the stores when I showed up, they were closed. And I, I was like, it was like the graduate with me banging on the door when Hoffman at the end is like, Elaine, Elaine. And I was like, I w- they tried to get rid of me, but I kept politely persistent banging on the door. And I think it took me, it was like eight bribes or something. I started at $20 and then I think we got to $150 for pound cake. So I said I could have a purchase and the other place closed early and I just I just was relentless, relentless and I got my purchase. So yeah, we did 171. And then I show how I was up for 27 hours on two hours of sleep and I show up to back to our apartment and like Christine, I mean, we'll tell you, I was covered in, in 
just dirt. I mean, I was delirious and I couldn't sleep because I was so caffeinated and just wired. What was days. that much caffeine and had an effect? It was not healthy. And then I was so like ab- you, you like you sensed it. Like now, if I drink like two or three cups of coffee, I can't really I, tell. I was shaking. I was literally shaking like this. My eyes were like by the end were saucers. And then then the next day when I finally got up, I went through all the receipts and I was like, there were 176 receipts. And I was like, how is this? There's only 171. I was so out of it. I went to five stores twice by mistake because I was so out of it. They all, I mean, they started to look the same and it was a little bit Groundhog day so, so, Yeah. <laughs> speaking of Bill Murray, so, so uh, why did you have the video crew? What did you want to do? What was your goal? I wanted to document. I mean, I was doing videos back then. Um, I was definitely, I, I got media attention for one other thing, but it was, it was really before people were doing a lot of stuff on YouTube. It was yeah. kind of new and I just, I just wanted to make a film. I mean, make a, a short. I mean, I was, this was like, I was on the Lower East Side and that's how Christina and I met. I had I had a comedy show that I would host and I would just show my videos. And uh, I thought it would just be a fun, like small video. And then it exploded. I mean, I was all, going on all these TV shows and it was just, it was it was something that really yeah, I saw you changed on, you me. on Jay Leno. Leno was going to book me. And it was one of those things where they were either going to book me or, or, or show me uh, a clip. And they showed a clip of, um, Leno and his monologue said, that, I think that, 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 he, that he's still caffeinated. And they showed me on the oh, Today yeah, Show that. with Lester Holt and they, they, they sped it up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, it was one of those things where it just it kind of blew up. And that that was one of the reasons I leveraged that to, to convince Ikea. And it took me months to convince them to, to have me move in. And they said, yes, it just took me polite persistence, polite persistence. So at first they said no? They didn't say anything. Uh, they said, oh, they were just like, what? And I, and I explained what I wanted to do and why. And it was just like, like Steve Cohen is amazing. Like your book or producer. I, like, that is how I know you. This is why I'm here. Because those two episodes, I listened to your show. I was like, I just, there's so he's not normal in a good way. <laughs> and I just needed to, I wanted we to talk to that, him for yes. persistence. And um, there was just something where I was just fascinated um, with, with Steve. And I was fascinated. What were we, we were just talking about? What, how did this Ikea. Relate? Ikea. And it was one of those things where Steve is really good at pointing out why somebody should say yes. If somebody says no, he'll revisit it and be like, this is, these are, these are the advantages. So finally, I think Ikea wanted to get rid of me. So then they, they their, their agency, they're like, the agency is going to do a call with you. And I rehearsed this with like my friend over and over again, everything. I was like, be hard on me. Every, anything you can ask me, ask me. I rehearsed with her, and then I, when I did the call with the agency, every, three by five cards all over my desk with every scenario I could imagine that they were asking me. And they asked me some tough questions, but I was prepared. And after that... What could be tough questions that they could ask you? <laughs> I don't remember at the time, but it was like one of... The, I mean... I like, think, are you going to use the employee bathroom versus a, the, yeah, yeah, one like, of the like toilets? Yeah, bathrooms <laughs> and like, how are you going to stay over and like stuff like that? Are other are people going to be... Are staying... cities in Sweden? Yes, exactly. Can you speak Swedish? Erdu Svens means, are you Swedish? That's, I did learn that. But um, <laughs> yeah, so it was one of those things. And then finally, they're like, a couple months, we've come to Paramus, New Jersey. And I was like, okay, I'll come to Paramus. They take me, I go to Ikea. I'm in Ikea and they take the, the back room and it's Ikea and uh, the agency. And after, it was like five or 10 minutes of talking to me. They just had a couple questions. They, the, one of the, the Ikea person was making the decision that said, there's something about you that we, we trust you. There's something. You could really mess us up, but there's something about you that we're, we're going to do this. And I, I just couldn't believe it. I, I could not believe it. And I said, when are you going to send out the press release? Like, Mark, you don't understand. We're going to give you full creative control. You're doing everything. And within three hours of me moving and the Associated Press and Reuters were there and it was international news. And afterwards, that same person from Ikea told me, I, I just wanted the video content. I wanted the experience. But Ikea... Very brave and smart. I mean, they got more publicity in the United States than the history of the company on Mark Lives in Ikea. And it was only because they, they took a calculated risk and they knew my stuff was family friendly. I mean, I told them that, I'm like, do you want to look at the videos before they go out? And they said, no, we trust you. Like if you saw, I'm not saying you did see this. I have no idea. If, if you hypothetically saw a rat in, at night running around Ikea, you would not have filmed it, for instance. I, if it was something that, that added to the narrative, like there was just the, was there just a rat, rat in the in the Metro card thing yesterday or something like oh, that? I don't know. I don't know. If there's something, if, if it added to something that wouldn't hurt them, I, I would. But my stuff is not, I'm not trying to get a reaction. I'm not trying to make anybody look bad. Like with the Apple Store thing where I brought a goat into the Apple Store to prove that you can do anything in an Apple Store. I, I, I heard Apple was really happy with it because I was not trying to be mean spirit. It was just like, this is a company that's different. I'm, I don't want to make anyone look bad. So, okay, you were 
ordered a, a you were in the Apple store, you ordered a pizza to be delivered, right? That was the second floor, and Christine's hilarious because she's always like, we're going to get in trouble, we're going to get in trouble. And it turns out on if you, at the Apple store in the second floor in Soho, they will deliver a pizza, and other people that work there I thought that was so cool. They wouldn't take any pizza. I offered them, I guess they were on the, on the job. So it was like one thing after another, I was like, there's going to be something that you're not allowed to do in the Apple store. Like We, we had our date in the Fifth Avenue store with um, a friend, it was somebody playing music, and then a trumpet, and then we were served dinner by a caterer, and then there was something else going on. Oh, di- the disco ball, and we were dancing in the middle of the store, and I asked them to turn down the music. They wouldn't do that. Oh, but, I'll, tell you, um, I'll tell you where I've been. Yeah. Um, so you can't take photographs in the Apple store. They, and Starbucks is the same, but it's one of those things where if you just do it, I've seen people do it, they don't. It's strange, right? You wouldn't think like you like you couldn't take a photo in a Starbucks or an Apple store. Maybe I should have done that, but instead I brought a goat. I dressed up like Darth Vader at the Apple <laughs> store to get my phone repaired, and I thought I was going to get kicked out because they all were coming towards me, but they all wanted photos. All, everyone that worked for Apple, they wanted to get photos with Darth Vader. And um, and then the goat thing. That was the thing that we were on the subway, and Christine was so nauseous that like we're gonna get in trouble bringing a goat into the Apple Store. And we had somebody that had a petting zoo. We had in an SUV brought a goat up to 66th and Amsterdam. We met them at the parking garage and we're parading. Like when you can get jaded New Yorkers to actually stop in their tracks yeah. and look, you know you're doing something right. So and, so so yeah. I I still want to unpack the whole thing, which is that you come up with this idea. Yeah. There's just some quirky idea. Yeah. Could be a- anything, yeah. And you figure, okay, this the bar is high enough that there's entertainment value. You arrange to do it, which has some difficulties, and and like you say, persistence. You get the camera crew, and then you figure out strategies to to make it go viral. I tried. I mean, it was one of it was my curiosity, and like I I didn't really know how to get the press, and it just like after the Starbucks. I kind of figured out when you're doing a subject heading, and I still use this, get their attention. I mean, some They're people- They're looking for stories. They are. and But like the thing is, is some of my friends, and I've my good friends, I've, I've helped them out over the years because they have something good, but they would do these mass emails to all the journalists without something catchy. And I would always tell them, it's going to take more time, but I'd always be like, in the subject, if I was emailing somebody in the media, Susan, I would, I would email everyone individually, hi, Susan, and Steve knows this too, in the subject heading, uh, forward slash man gets carried- 9.4 miles in NYC. Like, man uh, lives in Ikea. And that, I've really found that my average with, with getting media attention skyrocketed. So I wait, would wait, really, what, was the, what was the trick? Just saying man, does, like putting... It was putting their name, not doing a mass email to like 300 journalists, but emailing them individually so they're going to click on it. If you put their name in the, the subject heading, if they say, hi, Susan, or hi, Todd. But that still could be a mass email. It could, but back then, that really wasn't okay. happening. This was a while ago. I mean, this was like 10 years ago or something like that. And then, um, so they weren't doing it. And then just getting there in as less words as possible, having it pop off the screen or something. I mean, we did a, I did an internet detox. I had, I don't know what your, what your relationship is to your iPhone, but it was out of control with me. And I was like, where in New York could I go where I was not tempted to check my phone and that I wouldn't have my phone. So I locked myself in my bathroom for five days without any internet access or, or my phone. And man lives in bathroom to get over, over internet detox. I mean, that's like, it jumps off. So, I mean, it, it depends on what it is, but if you can do it in few words and have it jump off the page. That's the way to go. To and, get and, media. and 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 uh, obviously the media attention's fun and the experiences yeah. are, are very interesting and you could talk about them. And yeah. What what do you feel? What else do you feel you're getting out of doing all these experiences? Well, my curiosity. I mean, that's why I did the Carson podcast about Johnny Carson. That's why I'm doing persistence. I'm just there's some things I'm fascinated with and I have endless questions about. I mean, I was a huge. Um, I used to go to Letterman when I was 16. I would drive up from Hershey, Pennsylvania, and go to the NBC show. And he's, he was like Carson, very private, very few interviews. What goes on behind the show? And then when I got when I was 22, and I got over there to the Sullivan Theater, and I kind of like everyone, I got to learn what actually how the show was put together. And it was like one of those things. It was just all my questions being answered. But it was and and, yeah. and your stuff sounds like a lot of his early kind of almost man on the street <laughs> oh, yes. stuff. I was a huge fan. I mean, he you, was you the could guy. picture him. Yeah, these are like extreme versions yeah. of what like he might do. Dave really. I mean, Steve Allen was the guy that was doing the Man on the Street, and Dave took it to like this other level. I mean, Conan, his first year and a half or two years, um, was not doing. They wouldn't touch doing those remotes, which Conan became famous for because they just didn't want to. It was Robert Smigel more than anyone did not want them to be compared to. And Dave was just so good at those things. And I mean, and then it got to. I think it was two thousand or maybe 98 where he just was too famous and he couldn't do them anymore and it but that was to me that was quintessential letterman so so um i mean so have you considered other things like 
doing a, a reality show around all these experiences or have you, have you pitched? Yeah, you I've know, done these things. Like, I mean, I, I mean, it's- Where, it's, where, where have you failed in terms of persistence? Because per, <laughs> pers the fact that you're doing things that require a lot of persistence means that a lot of things are also saying no all the way to the end. I'll like tell you're you not getting things. the yeses. I got, I'm not going to go into this great detail because it's crazy, but I, I did ask Starbucks if I could build a Starbucks store in my parents' home in Hershey, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and I was convinced that this thing was going to happen. And I actually was in Seattle and I was heartbroken when it didn't happen. And the, the younger people were for it. I've heard, I got heard from people like, we want to do this. And just like, this was really before I think that the, the stuff was on social media was as prevalent as it is. This was a bunch of years ago. And that was what I wanted to do because there was no Starbucks at the time in Hershey, Pennsylvania. So I was going to send away my parents. And like, my dad would have thought it was hilarious. And then my mom would have not so much, but she loves me and would be supportive. And then help have all the neighbors kind of have a fully functioning Starbucks. And like my this white suburban house have the Starbucks sign come on, but like but construction workers come there and like really wreck the house. And then they would put it back and give my mom a new floor where she'd be happy, put it back. But I wanted to do that and that did not work. They just said, uh, we don't, we're not interested. They or? said that the younger people said they wanted to make it happen. And they just, I think it's hard to navigate through something like that. Yeah. And like some of the senior people said that they were really going to think about it and consider it. But it just, back then they were not doing anything online. I mean, they asked me to do, they were doing a via the instant coffee, a road trip. And they asked me to do, um, be one of the people. Um, that was like one of their first forays into online entertainment. But I was living on the airplane at the time. It's like road trip, Starbucks or the airplane, get over my fear of flying. So, um, but yeah, that was really early on. I think if like it came today, they'd be more for it. And and what's another what's another failure? The Murray thing. I fell on my face. I mean, Which I one? still think it's going to happen. The Bill Murray thing. I still think it's going to happen. I really I do think, think. Here's what I think, though. Yeah, I think you have to do something more interesting than say, "Hey, come over for dinner." Yeah, it has to be something where and it like the like invite them yeah. to like air hockey or something. It has to At be the, something. The Chinatown yeah. arcade, you yeah. know the one. Yeah, yeah. Got Air hockey. They got all these games or do the dance games. It has to be spontaneous in the moment. But I think Murray's still going to happen. Some other things that didn't happen. I'm I'm trying to think. Baseball thing. I've been talking to Major League Baseball. One team. I'm not going to mention. We talked for five years. The team wanted to do it. MLB wanted to do it. We just could not figure it out. MLB, very hard to crack. Again, I think now with the stuff online, they it would be a lot easier to navigate. And it's been like two or three years since I've been in touch with them. And I should revisit it. Like I love- well, What did you want to do? I was going to live in a baseball stadium for a week and do every functionable job in the stadium from doing like groundskeeper to being the, the announcer to being a bat boy because there's like endless amount of jobs in, yeah. in one of those things and like what, and you'd sleep in the stadium I or? would in like yeah. the on the field on the luxury box as I play uh, video games on the scoreboard Christine would stay one night and she stayed one night in Ikea she'd be with me and watch ro uh, romantic comedy on the scoreboard <laughs> so I wanted to conceivably do every That's job great. and I maybe it'll still happen I love you and Steve are again were the ones that told me Mike Massimino is your guy for persistence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Mike is, is like, it was one of the guys, one of the three episodes we launched with. And I mean, eight years, like a vision. Was that after years. we talked to you? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah he, I emailed him. I emailed he, him within 24 the, hours. He's amazing with persistence. He's the post, I mean, and AJ mentioned you too, and I told you before the show, there's certain people that have this vision that just, they just, they have that and they just make it happen. And it's one of those things where there's going to be roadblocks and Mike is a testament to that. And he just, I mean, vision. I mean, he could not see, he did not have the vision and anyone that would deter like any, literally anybody. Like couldn't see. Yeah. And it's like, you think. <laughs> it's like, not like how, he didn't have the vision to yeah. achieve something. And but. it's like, <laughs> that, literally. And it's like, how do you problem solve that? How like 99.9% .9 of people would be like, it's, you're, you're done, right? You're, right. You're done. And he. It's I like scientifically even, impossible. And I didn't even know about this. And I don't yeah. know how big it was on the internet at the time, but it was, um, the internet wasn't huge at the time, I don't think, but it was like, he went to get corrective vision. He took lessons and, and took therapy for his vision to, to improve his vision. He practiced every day and it only works for like 30 minutes. Yes. So he made sure yeah. like it was right before the yeah. test. And he failed the first time. And then he went, they let him take it a second time. That's when, when he finally, yeah. when he finally got it and he got it. And it, I think. And now yeah. it's no longer in the test to be an astronaut. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. It's incredible. I mean, he was like, well, what I, like, well, I liked yeah. about his story yeah. was he got his PhD at MIT, yeah. which is of course was after rejection. So he got his PhD yeah. in, you know, moving a robot around on Mars, which an unobvious topic unless mm -hmm. you want to be an astronaut. Yeah. And then he got a job at NASA because yeah. he was a PhD in robotics for space. And 
he moved literally to the suburban neighborhood where most of the astronauts lived so that his kids would be on the same soccer teams as their kids. He did, and he originally he sent them a letter. I mean, you sent out emails, and it changed your life, and yeah. it is one of those things, knocking on doors. I love the power of asking. It's a theme in the podcast, and you just never know. I mean, you've done it, I've done it, and you just never know when you knock on the doors, whether it's a letter, an email, or what it is, or Steve going to those events with you at night, or him going solo and just going up to the person and taking a huge swing, because if the more you do it, the more you're going to get, you're going to get a, a, a home run. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of Prize Picks favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his? You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. Look, Prize Picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, 
The quality speaks for itself. It's like these masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. Steve does everything though. Like he, we were on a train to DC the other day because yeah. we were interviewing yeah. the Supreme Court justice, and uh, uh, I didn't even recognize him sitting right next to me. Steve's like Lewis, Lewis, and then Lewis Black, oh, the Lewis comedian, Black, yeah. uh, turns around and, he, and Steve's like, um, "Hey, I really liked you." And this is how how you doing? You going to DC? What are, what's going on? And then by the end of it. He's like, you're coming on, you can come on our podcast. And Lewis like, yeah, yeah, sure. And, wow. Uh, <laughs> that is steep. But the thing is, he's naturally curious and he's a, probably a huge fan of Lou Black, Louis Black. And he's on my list too because. Well, you can't have him. <laughs> <laughs> time. Because I'm fascinated with him because I would talk to people that knew him when he was uh, at West Bank Cafe when he was starting out. It was like, he didn't get famous until his early 50s. I mean, it was really, I mean, it, it took it took years. I mean, he was at West Bank as the, he was doing the MC and it was just him falling on his face for, for decades. And his friends were getting famous, but he wasn't. And, and it wasn't he, until The Daily Show that he really blew up. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And he's 70 now. He's He says he does 110 shows a year. Oh, like, oh he's a rock sold star. Sold out theater shows. He's a rock star. He comes to my home, uh, the Central Pennsylvania, Her Hershey theater i think he was there this this month or next and like no sells out the place um sometimes two shows and it's just like he, he's so prolific he can come back every year to that location and have new material he has this voice but i mean he makes so many people happy but if he did not stick with that for the 20 years where he was a playwright and a struggling comedian yeah. if he didn't st st stick with that voice i mean he he certainly wouldn't have made he makes so many people happen he would not be at the place where he has this incredible place in New York and North Carolina and he can live this life and it was only because he just persevered. And those are the stories I, I want to pump myself up, pump others, and just hear. I mean, you're a persistent person. I am, but those stories just get me even more. Well, what, you what, what you said um, that was that's a very key thing for persistence about your own experience in the IKEA one. Uh, it seems like you naturally understand. It's got to be about their agenda. It's not like, hey, I'm Mark and I want to live in Ikea because I'm fumigating my apartment and then I'll make a viral video. It's like, hey, you know, Ikea's ad agency, how much would you pay to get all the amount of coverage that this is going to get, like in terms yeah. of free advertising? That's what I was, yeah, that's what I was talking. You need to talk their language, why it's in it. And like Mark and Ikea was essentially a sketch. So like our apartment, the fumigation thing was just like like a, a silly reason to say we were doing it. But like when I lived on the airplane, they wanted me to slowly do it uh, for 30 days, which set a Guinness World Record, which I didn't know. They put my face on the airplane that flew all I over saw the that, country. Yeah. And it was one of those things where I didn't see that, but they're like, we just want you to plug the Wi-Fi. And I said, it has to be about something. And Christine can talk about this i had a genuine fear of flying where i would i would it was un, it was like the most s safest mode of transportation it's ir an irrational fear and i i seriously had the thought i would have to get over my fear of flying i would may have to make myself fly over and over and over again every day for continuously to see um to until i was over it and it took me a a, a a week and a half of flying nonstop until I got to that point. But it was one of those things where I was curious about it and I told them it has to be about something. Yeah, so, but it's interesting though, for them it was about Wi-Fi. For you, it was about a challenge that a billion people in the world face. Yeah, and, oh, yeah, it was but, bad. But for them it was about, 
we got to promote Wi-Fi. Yeah. Uh, you <laughs> you me, do your thing. I but, wanted to do it with Richard Branson. I thought Virgin it was the best fit. And yeah, I, why wouldn't Richard I, Branson I, do it? I, I, I wrote the, the treatment up, and it was one of those things like I'm going to sit on this just for like a, mo- a couple months or whatever, and kept thinking about it in my head. And again, people are like, "This is impossible. Like for you to, to pull this off, that like it would have to be that like the, the TSA would have to be involved in all these things." And I have it in my 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 head. And then somebody I know uh, sends me a message on Facebook like, "Mark, we were just in um, a meeting with AirTran down in Atlanta, and they brought you up." And they want to know if you want to live on their plane to promote their Wi-Fi for a week. And I said, no, it has to be a month because I don't think a week can be enough for me. Like they actually wanted you for a month. They didn't think you would agree to that. I was like, oh yes, I That's will great. agree to. And so, yeah. so you would, you, would you? Did you do first class the whole time? I was in business class. I didn't shower for a month. I had to clean myself with baby wipes every other day. I'd be in the same bathroom, that tiny bathroom, um, washing my hair over the sink. Were um, you? Were, was the air okay for a month straight? Yeah, it wasn't bad. I mean, I was piping. I was. I mean, my hand. People that were working with me for me, they got sick. I mean, my handler got vertigo. My other person got sick too. But I was popping so many vitamins, and like when people would get off the plane, it was a commercial airplane. I'd be jump, jumping, jogging up and down to get exercise. I was some vitamins. Um, all these things to try to, to, to keep did up. You, my did emotions. you stay hydrated? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was one of those things. And I think with the radio, it's, it's not apparent. People were sending me articles that this was not the safest thing with the radiation and stuff up in the air, and people were, were getting clots. So I was doing stretches. Yeah, yeah. Blood clots is a big, a big issue. But if you're running yeah. up and down the plane every oh, I was, forty minutes or so, it was definitely psychologically the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I mean, Christine flew with me on the weekends. They would book flights with her mm-hmm. for her to see me. We had our anniversary on the din- dinner uh, on the wing, for our anniversary dinner on the wing of a plane in Atlanta. Uh. So um, yeah, it was definitely a crazy month, but it was, it was the hardest thing I ever did. You know, um, maybe you can explain to me why this works. So I was terrified of flying forever. Like if there was even the slightest turbulence, I would look over at the stewardesses. I would look around, see who's panicking as much as me. I automatically assumed this is it. I'm going to die. I'd be terrified. I'd be really sad. And then I did one mental switch, which normally I feel like it's a cliche to say I did this one mental sw- switch and then it worked. But this one mental switch and it totally works. So and it works so well that I actually now enjoy turbulence. And I'm I'm afraid of heights. I was afraid of turbulence. I don't like roller coasters. Anything relating to heights or moving or that feeling of out of control for your body, which happens in That's what it is, the out of control thing for most people. Right. So yeah. so the one mental switch was, do you know the TV show Lost? Oh, yeah. We're, we're, we're actually on, what, season five or six right now? We're re-watching it. I've watched, I, we yeah, love I've watched Lost. it like three seasons. I, I'm we're re-watching calling it. bullshit on everyone who doesn't like the series finale. I think Lost is the I best series. I love the series. show. I mean, yeah. I, I, the, I mean the, the, the two brilliant. characters that they have on the island, the two out, um, con people, I know people criticize, but I even, I enjoy the Wait, show. Wait, which two people? It, what are the characters? Like, it's with the two characters that are like the con Season oh, three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know what? Yeah. I was a little upset at the writing in that one only because I thought it was a filler episode yeah, I mean, just it, to finish the season. Because it was a whole episode, which probably, and like we saw Damon Lindelof speak. And we, um, speaking of loss, we had Michael Emerson on the Persistence podcast, 43 years old when he got his break. Oh my and, God. And he, yeah. of course, is, uh, what was his name in the show? Uh, ben Linus. Yeah, yeah, Ben. I mean, he, what a character. He was great. He was like was, the best yeah. actor on the show. Oh, he was like, I mean, I was te- we were telling him, like, you could not take your eyes off of Ben Linus. And he was one of those guys, 43, when he got when he could quit his day job here and make it. And then I don't think it was, that was like 98 or something like that. And then and then he didn't, it wasn't years later until he got lost and became, got the Emmys and stuff. But he's an amazing, amazing performer. I love him. I, I love him too. And um, yeah. the, my favorite scene in all of Lost, uh, and by the way, then I'll get back to my yeah. m- my my mind switch. And about yes, I want to hear. Fear of like, my favorite scene um, is he finally meets Jacob and he and and he's like, you know, what about me? And and Jacob is just like so monotone and could care less. And he's like, what about you? And like just all of Ben's whole life it's, and dreams and everything it, is zero. And he and then he does his thing. Ben Linus, and then we'll talk about the flying because I know people want to get <laughs> cure themselves, but lost is more important. No, is um that's <laughs> true. That that Emerson's character. I mean, there's these highs and lows, but he is one of the funniest characters yeah. that's written. I mean, we are always laughing. He was at smart. Him. Like, he's like the economic relief. The wise, the, oh yeah, the wise cracks and all the comebacks. He's amazing. Him and Terry O'Quinn were going to do a pilot together for um, J.J. Abrams and Bad Robot, but they never did. It never got got made. But I would have loved to have seen that. But he's great. So how do I get over my fear of flying? Okay, so every time there's turbulence now, I start. 
I don't know if I could should could say this out loud. I mean, I don't, I don't mean it seriously, but I start p- literally praying that the plane will crash and I'll end up on lo- on the island of Lost. <laughs> And then I'll get to hang out with Jack and Kate and Hurley. <laughs> Saeed and, will be there. Yeah, Saeed. We're all going to hang out. It's going to be oh great. I'll go on the adventures with them instead of being one of the nameless people always in the background. You're not worried about the smoke monster? Not, uh, well, no, because I believe I have faith in the island, so I'm, I'll get along with the smoke monster. So so I'm always praying that 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 everything will just that this turbulence is is the first thing that happens before the plane eventually you know if i'm sitting in the right one of the right rows it, that i'll end up on You'll the island lost. lost it does seem like a good fun group of people and and it's, it works yeah. by the way like i in, i literally enjoy the turbulence then and i'm really? just thinking about the the show and yeah. what, what i'm going to do on the island yeah. once i get there so that's your cure it's interesting my cure was all the pilots wanted to talk to me and they were in disbelief that i had a fear of flying and they're like why and I would tell them about, I did, I, it was the turbulence and one other thing. And they would all talk to me, talk me through this. Like they were my psychiatrist. They would say, Mark, all turbulence is, is being in the boat and going over a wave. It's driving over gravel, gravel. If the, we do not have turbulence, that there's a problem. Right. But yeah. so I would see, I watched YouTube videos about fear of flying. I, and they would, I would hear all those explanations. None of that worked. So why do you think, and I swear to God, my technique worked for me. Like I have no fear of flying anymore. That's amazing. Why do you think my technique worked? Damon Lindelof and J.J. Abrams created a stellar show. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> no, I can't think of it's true. anything else. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those things. Everybody's different. I mean, people from all over the country were emailing me that they had a fear of flying. These are people that would have buy plane tickets and sh- not show up to the airport. They would eat the money because they were so, that, that morning they just couldn't bring themselves to it. And I would try to just talk them through my personal thing but it was definitely one of those things where, I mean, I think Whoopi Goldberg, there was at least a decade where she didn't fly. And when, when she finally had to go over to Europe, she took a pill like, to knock herself out. So she, when she was, you know, sleeping the whole time. And I, yeah. I, I used to do that. You I used did to take, I used to take, yeah. um, this is like 10 years ago, I would take um, something called, a ma- I don't even know how to say it, amitriptyline. Yeah. You know that one? It's a, it's a muscle relaxant. Yeah. It's also a mild antidepressant. Um, but it literally puts you immediately to sleep for 10 hours. Wow. And like, so I would, I would take these flights to India, wake up, I would, as soon as I got on the plane, take one of these, wake up in Dubai landing, and then um, take some kind of uh, anti-anxiety thing to get to Bangalore. And uh, uh, that, that was the only thing I can do until I have my brand new technique. Now I don't take any medication for that. Distractions are good too. I think like if people are occupied with something, I think that that helps I too. tried that. I it tried reading, watching TV, yeah. Sudoku, everything. Nothing worked. Yeah, you should try doing stand-up since you're doing stand-up now. On, on the plane, on, next time on the and, plane yeah. <laughs> what's the deal with airplane food? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, um. <laughs> I've seen both. Well, that's, this is another story. I won't do that story. Um, so, have, okay, co- uh, let's unpack a couple of things here. There's, so, uh, Again, it seems like the whole collection of experiences you could pitch as a TV show or a movie or a documentary or a reality show or whatever. Have you thought about that? I did a pilot for True TV a couple years ago, and it was uh, I really, really liked them. They were nice. Um, it really I, th- th- what you're pitching is what I wanted to do, and just for some several factors, um, it just did not. It didn't come together the way that I envisioned it, and it did not get picked up. But yeah, I mean, what about for Netflix right now? They're they're spending you know twelve billion dollars. They are. Programming. I mean, I would love. I know they they definitely. Um, Netflix has deep pockets. I I had a meeting with them recently about something else, but I'd love to go over there. I mean, um, so so Hulu of course has that show. Here's Johnny, which is like a fictional series. Oh my series. gosh, yeah, Paul Reiser, who's on your show and my show, and that's in, in eight years. Like I would not think Paul Reiser. Uh, being Paul Reiser would take eight years for some but for an idea that he had to get greenlit. I mean, everybody it seems um, has these stories about uh, Splash, Brian Grazer, seven years I think it was. I mean, this, like they're just sticking with the vision and just per- persevering. Yeah, and it's amazing to me. Why does Paul Reiser get rejected for anything? Like he's made so much money for the television industry, and he knows everyone. He's yeah. like, go to his best friend Seinfeld and be like, well, "Can I put your name as a producer on something?" And like NBC has to say yes if it's Seinfeld. I but mean, it, I would think. It, but it just reminds me, yeah. like, like HBO's crashing just got canceled. I know three seasons, right? Yeah. yeah so Judd Apatow yeah. couldn't t- call up HBO and say, "Hey, no, I need one more season." I, I, I'm, I was really surprised that 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 happened. Apatow has a deal with HBO. And I know that they're working. Yeah, he did on girls, a bunch right? Of yeah, yeah. He has a product, a deal with them. So does John Stewart. I, I was surprised. I mean, but it's like even Lorne Michaels. Um, I would say I would argue that Thirty Rock, 
um, without Lauren Michaels' name attached would have probably gotten canceled after the first season. He can definitely buy more time, but then 30 Rock delivered and started winning all the Emmys. But there, he definitely, he was producing Mulaney on Fox and that got canceled. He definitely has shows that get canceled, even Lauren Michaels. Okay, Martin yeah. Scorsese, Vinyl on HBO. Mick Jagger's producing it. One season. How do they, and it was a great show. I thought it was a great yeah. show. How did that get canceled? Bobby Cannavale, Ray Romano, how did that get canceled? I think it was an expensive show and I think the critics were mixed on it. And uh, I don't know. I don't know if HBO. W- w- I don't know. The, I, I'm, I'm guessing it was the price tag. I could be off on that. I mean, there's tons of broadcast TV shows that are. I don't want to say they're horrible, but they're not necessarily works of art like vinyl was that get renewed year after year. Yeah, they're making money for the network, and that's all. I mean, that's the bottom line. I mean, the Freaks and Geeks one season on NBC. Okay, one season. The best show ever, except for maybe Arrested Development, how does Freaks and Geeks get canceled? They didn't even finish their season. They were going to do 13 episodes. I did. I think they did like 11. I, there's this emotional attachment that I have to that show, and I think a lot of people have to that show. And the, the, of the, course, because ta- it's the first yeah. show for Seth Rogen, yeah. Jim, James Franco, Jason Segel, Linda Cardellini, yeah. Busy Phillips. Nobody, Paul Feig, like in yeah. the gig, no, nobody Paul had Feig ever- Paul Feig Apatow. Yeah, were nobody not, had, no one knew who they were. Right, nobody had ever, yeah. none of these people had ever done a yeah. show before, and, they, and it was huge. There were a couple other people, and I'm blanking, that did guest stars that it became famous too, and it was one of those things, the talent was there, the writing was there, and just nobody- I mean, my friends and I would watch it, but it just didn't have a mass appeal. And then it's one of those things where, it, like, years later with DVD, that the thing took off, and now you can't even imagine getting those group of people together. But it was um, that's although that they was did get together in this is the end. Oh yeah, 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 that's true. Except Rogan for Linda Carly, wasn't in that. Yeah, she's probably busy. She's doing a lot. But bloodline, Mad yeah, Men. Yeah, good for her. She's doing a lot these days. But it is one of those things where somebody has a, a, a unique voice and they're doing something different. People always say they want different in entertainment and. I mean, it just takes a while. I would I would say Conan took about a year and a half, two years for the audience to get over to really get him. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel, I would say, and I think he would agree with me. Um, I think that show took a, for the audience to really get it and for them to find their voice four years, I would say. I mean, it's just anything different. It takes a while. For, Jimmy, yeah. Jimmy Fallon, I think, was was really quick. But he switched the format slightly to be a little bit more game-like instead of interview-like. Yeah. And, and he, he focused on... These games that were short enough to be three to four minute YouTube videos that yeah. would go viral. He was the uh, first to do that. And the, yeah. the lip sync stuff, the yeah. history of rap, all this stuff was genius. It was. And like when he got the 1230 show, I will tell you that most of my friends, I'd say 90% in entertainment and comedians, were like, this is the worst choice ever. The first for somebody. And Fallon even knew this that a lot of people in comedy thought that this was not going to work. And all those people that I knew uh, were the first ones to be like, I was wrong. Like we were all wrong. I mean, he. I mean, the, the the format they were doing, he was the, he was not only doing stuff to, that um, was blowing up on the internet and just doing everything that wasn't done on late night. Um, and he was he was doing he was definitely there were elements of Johnny Carson where I was watching him early on that I'm like, and he was in Johnny's studio. The set was the same. He he would not do a warm up himself because Carson didn't do a warm up. So I had all these things with him, but there was something about him in that. I think he really saw the, the long term in terms of what was going to happen because he was the first one to get on Twitter. And I will say this. I will not say how I know this, but NBC, to, to what, and I've been told by somebody that would know, said no to him when he said he wanted Twitter. And, and Fallon was, was animate, I'm going to do it on Twitter. And no host was on Twitter at the time. Famous people, very few. And he's like, no, this is something, I'm going to do this. And he put his foot down and he he got it and he... He he was the guy that I really think had the vision with with these that this with the so with social media and and uh, clips living online. So so I, I guess here we'll, we'll this is a good segue into your podcast oh, yeah. on the on the Carson Show. Uh, and you've had so many amazing guests on. Everybody has some kind of relationship in some way to the Carson Show. But let me let me ask this first because I think I think there's an answer to this question. What is a late night show? Because I think there's a particular format. I, I mean, the late like night as show, as opposed to like Ellen, which is a oh, different sure, format. The, the daytime. Um, it's normally somebody with a desk. It's normally someone that comes out and does a topical monologue. There's a theme song, sometimes a sidekick, and it's all about the money. Um, a, a sidekick or like an orchestra. Yeah, or an orchestra, a band leader, some personality normally for the person to bounce around. And it's celebrities normally coming on to pitch, to plug things, or stand-ups coming to get t- attention for for themselves. And it's it's one of those things where they are cash cows. Like whenever I hear people talking about Valens number two or 
Kimmel's number three. I'm like, it doesn't matter. They are making so much money for the networks because they're, I mean, relatively cheap to produce. And I mean, the Tonight Show and the Today Show still are like the top money makers for, for NBC. I mean, they- So let's say Fallon's yeah. making 20 million a year, yeah. but he's doing what, like 220 shows a year or, or I don't know what it is. I don't know, but he has the pro- pro- product placement. He has the demographic and just um, the advertisers and the guests, the young guests that they want. And uh, yeah, I mean, he- it, yeah, all those shows every year go down slightly in ratings. I, I, I mean, Colbert is going has has definitely um, gone up when he started going. Um, he, at first, he was not doing great because he, he was not taking sides, and when he took a side, that's when the ratings started to go up. Same with Seth Meyers. Yeah, saying. but they all were slowly going down. It's like normally, like the Academy Awards and the Super Bowl. Sometimes, I mean, it, sometimes they go up, but th- they've been going down. And the median like TV age, ratings in yeah. general, though, have all gone. Yeah, down. the median. I mean. People were have talked to me. They they cry. Some of them when they talk to me and going on Carson, it literally changed their life. I mean, it was like night and day. Like I mean, when they went on that show. So I mean, the same thing's not true anymore. So so basically, what you're referring to, someone like Seinfeld, would who was a, a already a, a successful touring comedian, he would go on Carson for his five, for to do a five minute set. Carson would pull him over to the chair. What's it called when you're when you're called over? Called to, up the couch. Called over. To yeah, the couch yeah, over. and. Uh, uh, and that, and then the next day, all the networks would call for development deals. Listen, <laughs> Drew Carey cries when he talks about it. I mean, it's so emotional that he was living in his car and and just going through obstacle after obstacle. And he was one of a few people that told me he was out of body experience. He had it in his head so much and replayed it over to head and visualized. And when he was performing it, he was out of body watching himself. And next day, changed his life. I mean, it was absolutely. Did a, he get like the Drew Carey show after that? He got a development deal, a team of agents, and it was. I remember watching his debut and being like, I, 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 he, I asked Stephen Wright who was the best debut you ever saw, and it was Drew Carey, and I could not argue with him. It's definitely, there's a, a lot of people that did well, but in terms of, I, of, of Drew Carey, there's probably a, a bunch of people that did as well, but I don't, I've never seen anybody outdo him. Oh, I'm going to watch his on debut. YouTube. Yeah, it's really, really strong. But I mean, he is so about the Carson, what Carson did. I mean, if you talk to Seinfeld, he'll still say that that was the highlight of his career was going on Carson. Kevin Nealon was just here playing Caroline's. He says the same thing with Saturday Night Live that he did in all these things. Carson was still the biggest moment of his career. So so even though like, like you know, we're sitting in a stand-up comedy club, everybody who's going to be on the lineup tonight will have been on some late night show and that's their credits. You might have seen him on, you know, the Seth Meyers or or Stephen Colbert, but it's not the same kind of career changing thing. It's, it's not just a normal, credit now when, yeah. you're, when, you're, when you're going on stage. It, it's definitely a credit. I mean, back in the day up until whatever, what, 92, there was Late Night with David Letterman, which is at 1230, Carson at, at um, uh, which was 11.30 and Letterman at 12.30. But, uh, and then Arsenio came, but there was, I mean, people would try to take on Carson, but not last. But like, I mean, Joan Rivers? Yes. I mean, she one year on Fox. And, and, and um, it was one of those things where it was, Seinfeld calls it event television. I mean, I remember that you would stay up until 11.30 and it was this huge thing because like you were not going to see this the next day. And sometimes they, and maybe you would catch it on a rerun, maybe not. But like you knew when you were watching this, that this was like an event, uh, water cooler talk and people would stay up and watch Carson. Uh, the Letterman thing was so outrageous at the time and so innovative that it was underground almost when they started at first. And like people would stay up until uh, one in 30 in the morning. And then you had Bob Costas, which is one of the greatest shows ever later with Bob Costas. And he would have these people like Paul McCartney and Keith Richards and Audrey Meadows and Jerry Lewis and just talking like this. And it, they, they had this, this, this amazing lineup where people actually would, would take uh, uh, their sleep. They would sacrifice sleep to stay up and watch this. And going on those two shows late night with David Letterman and uh, Carson just it changed people's lives. So, so now I, I agree. These these things are huge money makers because all it is is a basically a set, a band, and a, a staff of writers, and and then you, the main cost probably is there is the the host's salary. The host salary, and they're paying, um, of course, like writers and the crew, which everyone works so hard on those shows, um, and the talent. The hilarious thing is you have Harrison Ford on, which people are tuning into Tom Cruise. They're getting scale. Yeah. So yeah. It's... And and what do, what do you think? Um, what do you, what do you think that is a sixty second spot? Like if an advertiser wants to advertise on the Tonight Show, what what is a sixty I'm second spot? I'm not really cost? sure. That's such a good um, question. I I don't know. I know that um, 
in late night, I mean, that Carson was able to, with the ratings, the demographic for 30 years, I mean, he could book Tony Bennett and like not book like the rock stars and still get the ratings because there was no other show in town. Well, well, when you say they're profitable, like, do you know how, like, let's just assume, I'm going to guess. I'm not sure how much. I'm going to guess the the average late night show costs 50 million to produce a year. Maybe. So, So I think much less, but I could be off. Uh, uh, well, if the if the host, let's say the host is is you might be right twenty million, yeah, and then yes. um, uh, uh, there's like a hundred people on the staff, and I'm yeah. just saying they're all averaging, you might be right, yeah, you know, with benefits and everything like a sure. hundred thousand yeah. dollars, and then other costs. I don't know, like forty to fifty million. Yeah, and the Sullivan Theater and like the space isn't cheap. Sure, there's a lot of things like that. Health insurance. So, yeah. yeah, and so then, um, how many ads are on a show? I'm sorry if we're doing just math on this podcast, but how many ads are on like an hour show? So an hour long show is is forty four minutes. So there's sixteen minutes worth of ads. So sixteen sixty second spots, say, yeah. or, or thirty two thirty second spots. Um, Do the math. I mean, it's their p- premium. Let's say it's fifty thousand per thirty second spot, and there's thirty two of them. Product placement too these days. I'm certain of the shows as well. Like where does the product the placement happen? I think Fallon's done it a couple times, and Kim will do. We're actually on the show. The work and the sponsor, and Carson occasionally would do that. They would Ed McMahon would do a live commercial, or Carson would hold up a product very quickly and stuff. Okay, but, well, yeah. even let's let's say yeah. without the product placement, and let's say. Let's say it's only twenty five thousand mm-hmm. dollars for a thirty second spot, yeah. which which seems small. Yeah. Okay. We're talking about a hundred fifty million in revenues just from the ads, <laughs> and, and a show that costs fifty million to produce a year. So that's a hundred million in profits. I'll say also with reruns. I mean, they're uh, half the time it's in reruns, and they're still getting that that as much money as they would on the regular show. So I mean, the reruns. Yeah, because none of you are watching the show, yeah. watching the YouTube videos yeah, and stuff, and they, so the advertising is just going to cost the same, yeah. maybe only a little bit less. Yeah, it's incredible. What Carson was able to do for do the movie years. studios pay them in terms of like, hey, if we pay you, we can, we want every single movie uh, uh, promoted. I don't think that that's how. I don't think so. To my like, knowledge, that's how Barnes no. and Noble works, for instance. See, I don't think so. I don't think that that happens. I know that like sometimes a publicist will be like, if you want our top star, you need this other person, and some shows will say yes, some people will say no. But to my knowledge, I don't think so. But I could be off on that. You know, we've had a lot of um, producers on the show. Like we had on. Uh, uh, who are some of the producers now? I, can, I, I can't remember all the names. Uh, no, Brian Grazer's book on Curiosity is so fast. No, no, producers of the shows, of the late night shows. Oh, late night shows? Um, we had uh, Jay Leno's, Dave Berg. You know Jay, Dave Berg? He, I thought he was, I, I, I don't know him, but I've heard his name, sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, John Max. Uh, oh, John Len- Yeah, Max was like it. One of Letter- Letter- um, Leno's top writers and writes yeah. for the Academy Awards and all the shows. He's always in top demand. Yeah, yeah, John I'm, Max. I'm trying to think if there's any others. I think John Max was the main guy. And I used to actually, John John was a really nice guy. Yeah. I wrote him a couple of times yeah. lists of jokes and he would grade them. The guy write <laughs> really? jokes. Yeah, it was really oh, kind of gosh, educational. And he would a, tell me why. And the, it was educational. The guy's a machine. I remember Chris Rock talking about writers that he would want on the Academy Awards. And he mentioned suggesting somebody that, that, that John, that, I mean, he, for Chris Rock to say, you know, that, I mean, that's major credibility. Yeah, well, and Chris Rock had essentially a late night show on HBO. He did, and I thought that was fantastic. It I was did one the of website things, for it, by the way. It was one of those things. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, that was an amazing show, and it was one of those things where it was once a week, and there were you could do whatever you want on HBO. I thought a lot of the writing was was uh, was just top notch. Louis C.K. was the writer. Yeah. Yes, he was over there, and there was. I'm not going to mention, but there was somebody that worked for Letterman and someone for Chris Rock, and he told me the biggest difference between the two guys is Letterman never wanted to go out and do the show, and Chris Rock could not wait to go out and do the show, and that was the, the biggest difference. But it is a huge difference doing 20 shows a year versus what Dave was doing. I mean, oh my gosh. I mean, going out to do those remotes, the amount of pre-tapes and what he, what the number of hours he put. I mean, Carson was showing up at 2.30. Do the 5.30 to 6.30 and was out at 7. I mean, the show in 1980, until 80 was 90 minutes. But I mean, the Letterman, oh gosh. I mean, it was it was definitely took its toll. But I love the Chris Rock show on HBO. So 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 late night, obviously, still is profitable or maybe even more so now. Just so the dollars are bigger. Um, but yet the cultural impact, except for maybe the Daily Show with John, when Jon Stewart was there. I would say Dan Jon Stewart was the whole, yeah. That, 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 that had cultural impact. But none of the, not criticizing the other ones. I think it's just it's diluted the cultural impact of uh, you know Carson was the only one really until Arsenio Hall and 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 whatever and and mm-hmm. but but there was something about Carson too where he was able to play the everyman even though he clearly wasn't 
and he had taste in the sense that he would he could make or break careers. Now he had kind of his biases, which which unfortunately affected some people and not others. He but, didn't like Leno. He did not like um, Jay. And he, not as a person, I'm saying, he did not, his humor, he wasn't allowed to do the show for eight years. He did the show a couple times and he's like, he's not coming on again. Yeah, he didn't want it, Leno to it, be it, the, they, uh, the, he wanted Letterman to be the replacement, right? He did, but it went further back. I interrupted you, I'm sorry. No, I'm just curious okay. what you think is, what was what was special about Carson that really, yeah. I mean, he was different than Steve Allen and Jack Parr. Like, he really made that show. He was a hu- just a huge fan of comedy. And he, it was, when he did the sketches, they were all homages to other people. All those characters were like um, like one of the Smothers brothers. He, they took a character from Jackie Gleason, Jonathan Winters. He was just a fan of comedy and he was able to have this likability. I mean, when you're behind that desk and he told Conan the same thing, it has to be about you. And Conan for the first year and a half, it was all about the writing and we didn't know who Conan was. And then they started, they scaled back the writing. And when people started to get to know who Conan was, that's when the show became successful. So, so yeah, so what do, you, what do you think that means? It has to be about you. Like how did, because Carson was also very private. He didn't really... Yeah, Re- he wasn't very revealing or vulnerable. He on was the, on very. I mean, occasionally stuff would come out, and it was one of those things where when it did, I've done so much research on this that I've I've definitely I was surprised with some of the stuff that has that has come out that he that he did talk about about his childhood and his parents and stuff online and um. But yeah, it is one of those things. He was very private. Steve Martin said he was m- more famous than the president, which I don't think is an, an exaggeration. I mean, the president, anyone who was the president had more interviews than Carson. I mean, Carson uh, was like that. But there was something where people in the cities and in the Midwest and wherever would tune in. I mean, he 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 had the power to 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 get over with all these people, and he would have on. What the, do you think that is? What do you, how do you think he had that? How do you think you cultivate that? I, I, maybe it's growing up in Nebraska that he had that, and then he, he was in the cities for so long. I, I, I don't know. He was a performer before, and he was a magician, right? He was. He was a magician. I, I mean, incredible talking to like someone like Dick Cavett, who was 10 years old when he met Carson, who was 21 in a church basement when Carson was doing a magic show, <laughs> and Cavett going backstage before the show and Carson not being happy until he found out. I was like, oh, I'm a magician, and then Johnny showing him how to be tricks and stuff. So these people have emotional attachment to this guy, but he— I mean, listen, people tried to take him on. Joey Bishop, um, Alan Thicke, Joan Rivers. I mean, there were a bunch of people, but no one could touch him. I mean, the only other success story like this, and Carson went almost 30 years, was Lauren Michaels at Saturday Night Live. No serious competition since 1975, October. They premiered. Like, it's, you. I, can't, I still can't, I don't understand how they don't even have somebody that's even come close to even... Tr- Making a dent, but nobody's been able to. But Carson, I would say in the beginning, Letterman when he when he when he moved down to the late night spot on on CBS. Oh yeah, because Dave started at CBS in August of '93. Carson retired in May of '92, and then Leno. He he was beating Leno for like the first two years. Yeah, until Um, Hugh Grant went on Leno. You know, I've talked to so many people about this, and that's what the media says. And there's there's a little bit of truth, but the way it, it Leno. The way I saw it and the way I've studied it and other people and people that I knew that were working with Leno, it was it Letterman that was burning out. I mean, he was not, he just could not take what was was required of that show. And Jay, no one's going to outwork Jay Leno. I mean, there's certain people that are just not going to be outworked. And um, Jay was doing the first 35 minutes. His whole theory is you do the first 30, 35 minutes of, of all comedy. You don't get the guest out until later. People will stick with comedy. And Letterman had the guest on earlier. And I think Leno was right. I mean, he... He was, I mean, I just think Jay would admit this too. He's very much accessible. He would sign every autograph. He would do photos with the audience members before the show if they asked. He would take Q&As. And Dave wasn't like that. And Jay just, I mean, his whole life was that show. I mean, he would go home right until 3.30 in the morning with um, the monologue and go to sleep for, for whatever, what, three hours and be the first one in the office at Burbank. I mean, there was, he was a machine. I, it was going to happen regardless with who Hugh Grant, but that's who gets credited. You know, um... Do you think Leno was the more skilled stand-up? Oh my gosh, without a doubt. I mean, Letterman hated stand-up. Stand-up was only a tool um, that he went out there to get um, a hosting, to do the hosting. I mean, he still, I don't think he's been in a comedy club in decades. Mm-hmm. He still says he gets sweats, so he breaks out in sweats. He, I mean, Jack Rollins, I mean, you've met him, I met him. He was the manager to all the greats, the late Jack Rollins. He told me, I mean, he was like, and Dave said the same, would say the same thing. He was not the strongest stand-up. He was a good MC, but he, he did it as a vehicle to get on Carson and Jack Rollins kept him off Carson they wanted him early until he was ready with his four appearances and to build up those four appearances. I mean, Letterman, I don't know if he could have gone on 
and did more like do a stand up for like an hour. Like, like pers- he could do crowd work and stuff, but he did, was, did not naturally have have the skill set of letter of Leno. I mean, Leno was born to do this. I mean, he is a stand up machine, but Letterman was was a complete. He was a broadcaster. I mean, it was completely different. Yeah, yeah. And so now you've you've done stand up. Oh my gosh, it's been a while. I haven't done it in a while. I'm so much more comfortable doing that the, the videos and the editing. I mean, I've been speaking live more and doing live talks, which is so much fun. I'm, but it's been talking about me getting back, Christine and I, about doing stand up. But you I, should. I feel like there's like oh, kind yeah. of a mini boom happening with stand up. Oh yeah, I mean, particularly because yeah. Netflix buys so many specials. It's now. incredible. I, Netflix and somebody I know that I was talking to that them they are pretty much the new Johnny Carson. They have been the the, the first. Entity since Johnny Carson to launch careers because they are launching people's careers. Netflix standups and I never, I never saw the correlation, but I do. I mean, it's not to a, yeah, maybe it, as big as an extent, but it is getting these people that were very unknowns with their specials and getting them out there. I mean, or, in or a even, huge way, even not necessarily unknowns, but maybe just not like nationally known. Yeah, I think I, so. I, like, like, yeah. like take like. Um, like Ali Wong, yes, you know she's done a bunch of specials on Netflix, and I think that's how the country knows her. I think even so. though she was already a great comic. Yeah, she was always a great comic. I think Maria Banford. I mean, if you can get on Netflix, one gentleman who is a very funny man. I don't know his work that much. It was was making the argument that he had to do Comedy Central because it paid more. And you know, if you need money, yes, you're you're gonna have to take it. But if you can't sacrifice the the money and go on Netflix for the wider exposure and more people know you, your social media, your bookings. I mean, Leno was so smart when he guest hosted for Carson because he he was the one that there were a bunch of other guest hosts that were up for it, and he said, "Pay me scale, give me scale the least," and it's like done. I mean, done. He knew in Vegas his rates were going to go up, his visibility was going to go up, and it was like that and, was such a smart thing. And you know, thing. like Leno's uh, savings strategy, like he would always save his income from The Tonight Show and his spending money was he'd go to Las Vegas up. on the weekends and do stand up. Listen, he does Sundays at Hermosa Beach with uh, Jimmy Brogan. He um st- even when he was doing the Tonight Show, yeah, he was doing the Sundays at Hermosa trying out new material. And then he was still doing like 100 to 150, I think it was 150 stand up shows a year in addition to the Tonight Show. I mean, he will not be at work. I mean, I've talked to people that know him and the way he is wired is like nobody else. So why do you think like after a certain age, why do you think some people don't slow down and they just keep on going and doing this. Yeah, because Leno's still doing it, right? The, the stand-ups and still doing his car sh- car, um, car show. I just think it's in them. I think it's like, I was in Mike Wallace's office be- with him before he passed away. It was like a year before he passed. And he was still going into work every single day. And like, I mean, it was, I mean, he knew, he knew the. I think he knew um, John Kennedy. I mean, he was talking about profiles and courage, courage and he was this ninety-year-old guy, and it was just something that, that about him. Where um, Mel Brooks, ninety in his nineties, still going into his office in Culver City, and it's something where they just really love what they do, and it's not work. I don't think you're gonna. If you talk to any of these people, they 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 look at what they do as work. I, I don't. I think that that a lot of these people would probably be doing it for free. I mean, they don't need the money, certainly. And so, so what do you do for for a living? <laughs> I'm I'm definitely uh, available for hire. Um, these days, uh, Carson podcast um, brands will pay me sometimes to do video. So we're tr- it's always trying. Like to you get could funded. definitely do. I was gonna say you could definitely do an agency. Given that you have done so many yeah. videos that have gone viral, and you're so creative and so curious yeah. with so many things, I'm sure if a company came to you and said, "Think of something with us." You would think of some amazing thing that you can do for sixty straight days with them, and do a video around it, and it would get publicity. I'm good. I'm good at getting press. Christina, I just sent in a deck at a place, and it was one uh, somebody that you know, and I'll tell you after the podcast. Somebody that 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 was like, Mark, you should try doing this, and it's pretty outrageous. And we sent in the proposal, and I think they might go for it. But it is one of those things where I think I'm. It's definitely a skill set to with um getting media um. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm doing these days. I mean, I have a new pro- a project that I can't announce for Carson. It's not nothing to do with Netflix that's going to be um, is scheduled to come out. And um, yeah, I'm working on it. I've been developing and working on a kids' comedy show uh, for all, um, a bunch of years now. Um, those are the things hey, I'm I could focusing see you on. Blues Clues ish. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it's my favorite thing in the world is doing the kids' show. I mean, it's um, it's we've done it comedy clubs around the city. We've done. Um, I've never advertised a birthday party, but these parents would find out about me and like we, we, Christine and I would go to these people, the, like 20 kids. But we've done three of these in this place. And like these kids, like they're, they're one kid will know me, the birthday party, and it's like 20 
26 year old kids and like we it's like I'm like <laughs> Bruce Springsteen it's like I'm, I'm Bruce Springsteen I'm picturing kids that are like 5 years old what's a tw- you don't call a 26 year old a kid Jay's 26 years old oh and that's 6 year olds <laughs> oh, 20 six years old. 20 children oh, that are okay. 6 years all old right, right. I don't I'm not do well <laughs> with the 26 year olds I've never done well with 26 year olds that I'm imagining <laughs> but no you get like the kids I mean we kids that come out to my shows when I do the live shows anywhere from like 2 and a half or 3 up until like 8 or 9 so I mean What do you do on a kids comedy show? Sketch, stand up and I do it in character. I mean I was doing this before um Colbert. I mean I've been doing the, the thing cuz so, like, Colbert do- would go into character. But like in 2007, when yeah. you started doing these videos, yeah. you know, or when you really started yeah, yeah. getting into it, what, what was paying the bills? The, the branded stuff. I mean, my day job at the Colbert Report, I listen, I am so grateful for the Colbert Report. I learned so much. He was so nice to me. I met so many amazing friends, but I, it was one of those things when I was there, at least once they saw you as something, you, were, you're, you weren't going to move anywhere. And the Daily Show was like that um, as well. And um, well, What do you mean? Like um, once they see you uh, as... Let's say I was audience the audience coordinator. coordinator. Yeah, I mean, they're I, not going to promote you to writer because they're like, oh no, he's just the audience coordinator. I was coordinator. told that the, that the Daily Show, Jason Reich or Jason Reich, I know him. I can't believe I'm getting his name. He was the last person that they did that with um, when they made him from writer's assistant, which has nothing creative in terms of of getting yeah. stuff on. They made him a writer, and then and Chris Elliott too. Yes, that was at Letterman. Yes, they, they, they. Adam Resnick, I think, was an intern. So Letterman was all about promoting within. I mean, if you go to the, the CBS version, half the the writers were former interns and people that were in accounting. Um, like Chris Belair, who's over at Fallon, who's an like such a nice guy and such a great writer. Um, they had regular jobs, but Colbert was a place, and I'm not complaining at all. It was just the way it is. Where if um, when I was there, they, if you were something, it wasn't until I think I left like a bunch of years later where they started to. to um, um, with a few, with the two people, I think that became writers that were within, and um, and I, at least one of them took a couple times. I think he had my friend. Um, I hope he's okay with saying it. Gabe Gronley, a really funny guy, had to leave the Colbert Report and write uh, for another show, and then they brought him in. But he's I, yeah. I always call this. I always call this the the Jesus effect. Yeah. So I'm gonna about to compare you to Jesus. So basically, Jesus was born and grew up in Nazareth. Then he leaves, becomes the Messiah. And when, but when he comes back to Nazareth to preach with all his followers and stuff, they're all like, ah, oh, you're just, you were the carpenter's kid. You, we don't, you're not like the Messiah. And he just never really succeeded where he came from, where he started. Oh gosh, <laughs> everyone was so supportive. I mean, they let me out to live in Ikea. Oh my gosh, this is so embarrassing. The writer's strike was going on and like Stephen had a speech for us. He's like, I got Comedy Central. John and I are taking care of both staffs. You're getting paid. Like we demand it. And we're like, oh my gosh. And so we were like literally going in and having bake-offs and stuff. Like they, like we, the staff, we had nothing literally to do. We'd be on the set watching movies. And the day that, the, that we, everyone came back from the strike is the day they let me move into Ikea. The timing was so embarrassing. They let me out when I was there. HBO Comedy Festival in Aspen. I, I I was I won a contest with a bunch of people. What year? I think it was 2007 or something. But they let me out. I mean, no other. I think no other show would have done that. They they said Stephen was so proud of me and people internally. They're like they they really supported me. I mean they they what were you win really the award cool. for. Oh, it was a contest, and they oh this is this, this so many lows. It was a, a, they put me on a showcase, and it was um, a, a showcase which was like the the worst showcase. Everyone knew it was going to be the worst showcase, and I, I did this video. I submitted a video which everyone loved. It absolutely killed. I was trying to get somebody famous on the stages of Broadway to ride the to- Ferris wheel with me at Toys R Us Times Square, and I had all these well known people in it. And I finally succeeded in that, and um, they they um, everyone loved this video. So then I arrived to Aspen and I'm like so excited to be here, be there. Andy Malinakis, who was um, doing yeah. a show on MTV, was hosting. And He's the hilarious. producer said, um, um, so Mark, um, guess what we're going to do for you? W- what? They're like, we're, gonna, we're not going to play your video at the showcase for ever, all the industry and everyone to see. It's even better. We are going to play your video at the after party. And I was like, my enthusiasm was just like, I have no poker face. Like Christine knows this. I can't hide. And like, I was just p- depressed for like the next two days. And then when it finally gets to the after party, they played the video, but not with any volume. And it was just like one monitor at the bar with my face Ugh. and Bowling for Soup, who was one of the judges. Um, they're, they're playing that, like, that 80s song and I'm looking at myself and I'm just like, and it was just the most... I mean, it was humbling. I've had so, and you've had this. We've had so many humbling things. Where like, this is going to be the time I have all my demo tapes and stuff, like still VHS and stuff, or see it the see the DVDs with all my contact information and business cards and like, it was like def- deflating. But my point is, is they let me do that. But then once I did Starbucks and once I did IKEA, 
I was going on national TV, still working at Colbert because I needed to get money. And then when they hired me to do Airplane, I, it broke my heart because I couldn't give them two weeks notice. I gave them like a week and a half. They understood and I was very emotional because I wanted nothing to get out of there more just because I really wanted to do the comedy. But I really felt grateful to them, especially him. He was, I mean, I, he was so encouraging to me. I mean, um, it took him a long time. I mean, he was a waiter for 11 years, I mean, in Chicago. And uh, he definitely had a lot of lows. And I mean, I, he doesn't remember this, but we met backstage at the Dana Carvey show when he, um, I think he was 32 when I was in college. But that was the first time I met him. Were you working at the Dana Carvey no, show? No, I wasn't. I was just going over to the show and I knew some people. And um, I was I probably shouldn't have been backstage, but I was. Louis uh, K. was the head writer there. Oh my gosh, it's an amazing group of people over there. I mean, um, yeah, um, Charlie Kaufman, who did all those, John, yeah, John yeah. Malkovich. I mean, um, Spike Ferriston. Um, yeah, Louis Dino. Um, um, yeah, amazing, amazing group of people. I was over there at a bunch of tapings, Carvey. Th that was mind-boggling to me because they... I mean, you had Carell, Steve Carell, you had um, Stephen Colbert, um, all these talents, and they, they, it got canceled after seven episodes. I was at the final, final taping that never aired on ABC, and it was brilliant. I mean, they did one of the sketches when Dana um, Carvey then hosted Saturday Night Live a year later, which I think I think Louis C.K. and Smigel Penn, which was the Tom Brokaw's, Carvey's Brokaw, saying um, all the scenarios, Gerald Ford dead today from a, bear, uh, from a bear attack, and he would do every scenario, Gerald Ford died so they could roll it in. They did it on SNL, but it was like incredible. And then afterwards... Um, it was one of those things where what Why are you going to do? Canceled? Why, why, they got canceled I, I, because um, the, the first cold open they ever did on the Carvey show, and I was at show number two, but I wasn't at the first one. It was Louis C.K. penned a cold open with with Dana Carvey as Clinton, and he um, he opened his shirt and he was breastfeeding actual puppies, and um, they got they were after home improvement. I mean, you had. It was like 40 million plus. I mean, Dana Carvey's show was getting 18 million people watching it, and they still got canceled. Um, and it was basically because. Um, people were sending in mail to, it was first Taco Bell. I mean, it was a Taco Bell Dana Carvey show and Taco Bell was getting, and ABC were getting uh, complaints. And then they become the Mug Root Beer Dana Carvey. They were getting complaints. And then it was Mountain Dew Dana Carvey show and complaints. It was just so edgy and at, like now on HBO, I mean, it would have been, it would have lasted forever. I mean, yeah. but like, it, like it, it would the same vein as Mr. Show with um, Bob Odenkirk and David Cross. But it was one of those things where they were just doing this outrageous stuff that was brilliant. I mean, I think people, st I mean, people still talk about the show and I would go there and marvel. And um, it was one of those things. I remember talking to Colbert um, at the final um, tape and it was that, I think that was one of the first times I met him and I was like what are you going to do now and he was 32 and he's like I don't know I guess maybe go back to South Carolina I'm not really sure wow and, and he was a writer on the show he was a writer and a cast member okay it's fascinating he's a good man I'm the only positive thing I'm also fascinated you were just like hanging out at the Dana Carvey oh, show oh man we could do a whole episode on, on me going to shows I mean I was in Hershey, Pennsylvania um, and I just like would write, pe write um, the different shows people that were on the show did and, you want to like be a like did you submit writers packs and uh, did you want to be a little. The show. I mean, I submitted to um, Conan a couple times. I mean, I, I, I a little bit like that. Would you want to be a writer on one of their shows now? I think I would do um, well on Kimmel, but not on the monologue side. Like, it's strange because, like, back in uh, on Letterman, you were either a monologue or a sketch guy. Conan, you were a sketch guy or a monologue. Fallon breaks it off with monologue and sketch, but Kimmel, you have to do both. And I'm friendly with people over there and everyone over there has been awesome to me, but I, I just don't have the skill set to write monologue jokes. On the sketch side, no problem. I think I would do well on there. I think with on Conan's show, I do well. I think I would do well on Saturday Night Live. So I'm, I'm really curious yeah. about that because yeah. I I love the, I don't always like monologue jokes because there's, there, there, there's no time to improve them and they have to be so topical, but there's such a tight structure to them. You have to basically say a really short premise and then yes, bam, a punchline. as short line. as possible. That's what Letterman wanted, as less words as possible. And it, did you have a hard time with that? I can't, it's just not in my skill set. And I know somebody else that I'm friends with that is a really well-known comedy uh, person and he does can't do it either. Everyone specialized. There were people on Conan's staff, there were people on all the staffs that would specialize on doing certain things. Like some people were really good concept people. Some people were really good joke punch-up people. Um, there were definitely people at Conan. Um, I know one person, Greg Cohen, on the NBC show, people were in awe of and he couldn't write a topical joke. I mean, it was, they had this, they, they had um, the, the people like Brian Kiley writing the monologue and then you had people doing the sketch. There are very few 
that can do both. I mean, you have p- some people like Jesse McLaren over at Kimmel, who's like a machine on Twitter, and that's how they saw him. He was just on Twitter. He got hired from his Twitter. And um, Same thing with like Rob Delaney, right? Like, uh, yeah, I mean, his Twitter is out of control. I mean, he's just so good at joke writing talent um, with that. Yeah, certain people, they hired somebody at Seth Meyers when they started based. I mean, he was a guy in Illinois with no entertainment experience whatsoever. It was just based on his on his Twitter. I mean, that's that's it's incredible what people can do when they're consistently consistently funny. But for the most part, it's that specialized thing. Like, I mean, people for the most part at SNL, like Alex Bays, who I, he was on the podcast six years, um, took him to SNL every year. He they said they they met they they had him on um, to meet with everybody. They said you almost got it, but you were like runner up. And then he was at LA waiting table sending in every year. He would send in a packet and fax every week. It was still faxing update jokes and. Um, after the sixth year, he was going to stop, and that's when they hired him. And he was writing yeah. for Tina Fey. Um, yeah, it was incredible that he 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 got that. Where was I going with that? I don't remember. Uh, Damon Carvey, Stephen Colbert, told, uh, yeah. South Carolina. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I know. don't know. We're on a roll. I'm fascinated though. by. Yeah, like, you know so many of the subtleties and the nuances of every late night show. All the show. shows. Yeah, I'm, I have friends. I know people on most of the shows, and I like uh, sometimes we'll visit on some of them. Yeah. And, but I'm I'm surprised you haven't made like gone further making a career was, being involved in them. I will like, tell like, you afterwards. I was with the executive producer. They asked me to fly out. I did it on my dime when I'm sitting there with the EP and all the writers on one show and they were considering me for something. And it's like, I mean, it was like I've been close on so many things and it's just like it was heartbreaking, but it's one of those things I just have to keep going. I mean, that's that's why it's cool talking to someone like a Michael Emerson or all these people because like I've been very, very close so many times. And I, listen, I am grateful. I've gotten to do so many things that like I, I growing up in Pennsylvania, if you said you, I would get to do this. Like, I mean, just what like, I, I don't think I would believe it. So I'm grateful for that, that I get to do this. But um, yeah, it's definitely, it's disappointing. It wouldn't, like, who would say it wouldn't be when um, the, all, like you get contacted by some of these shows and it doesn't pan out, but I don't know. Well, and it's experience just getting contacted by the shows. Oh, I, I'm like, grateful. And it's all learning and it's good to sit down with these people, with the, with the places and stuff. And like, I have faith in my ability. I really, really do. And um, just keep going and stuff. And so you're doing the Persistence podcast. Oh, yeah. Uh, you're doing the Carson podcast. Yeah, Persistence 360, the most persistent people. I, I, on my spreadsheet, and I'm embarrassed to say this, and I don't think Christine, Christine probably thinks I have 500 people on my spreadsheet. I, <laughs> I have 908 people on my spreadsheet, and I have 800 out of the 908 contact information I've been doing research. Um, more when I'm editing the Carson stuff. I'm sorry, kid. I could have been like doing something else. Um, but, um, yeah, so I'm like the, the most of these people that inspire me. So I mean, conceivably I could do this for 15 years. But. And the Carson podcast is basically you try to contact anyone who's, who's essentially been involved in in some way or, or, or fashion. Yeah, with people a- like that their, their lives changed on the show. People that knew him, like a Barry Diller, um, people at the network, people, uh, that worked for him, like his producer, Peter LaSalle, who the New York times calls the, uh, the talk show whisper, the host whisper. I mean, Peter was the producer for Arthur, Arthur Godfrey, Dave Letterman, producer for Tom Snyder, uh, producer for Craig Ferguson, um, and Carson. I mean, that he was with Carson. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I get to sit down with these people that rarely, rarely do interviews. I mean, I've had several But they people. must appreciate, like, how much you know of the nuances. I hope so. I mean, we were with, like, somebody... Um, we were with one person who does not do podcasts, who does not do interviews. She says no to everybody. And when she met with us, the first thing I said when we were going up was like, why did you say yes to this? And she said, two reasons, podcast, two, it's Johnny Carson. I love him. And I was like, I mean, I think that's what got, has gotten a lot of people to say yes to me, Carson. And they, they, they listen to an episode or two. And then listen, you do, I do a lot of preparation for the Carson podcast. You do more preparation hours worth. I know, cause I've talked to you and Steve than I do. I, I, I get endless emails from people that are impressed by my research. You do more research. And that, I think people will listen to those episodes. I mean, I listened to your Keith Hernandez thing and I thought you were like the biggest sports fan. And I was like, oh my God. Like, I, I mean, I don't Know who the new, where the New York Mets live? <laughs> you're meticulous <laughs> with your research, and it was one of those things. You're, um, I, I know you were genuinely, genuinely curious and enthusiastic, and I wanted to listen to you and her, Keith Hernandez, talk more. That's all I wanted. But you were rattling out all these facts, and I was like, James, James has done his homework. I mean, and it, it is that illusion where James is. There's no bigger baseball fan than you. Well, you know, it's funny because what's the difference between a podcast and a late night show? you get to spend like an hour, an hour, two hours with somebody and really 
dive in and, and you know, you're, we're not just promoting something we're talking and we're and listeners are, are learning and getting what they can out of your extremely unique story and you have to do the the work to pull that out of somebody oh gosh i couldn't do what mark Marin does and he does it very well which is almost no prep and just show up and talk to them he does it extremely well it's not within my skill set to do that in my comfort zone but let's but let's yeah. analyze that one though like mark Marin is is a great conversationalist and i think he makes the podcast about himself a little bit like he'll take their stories and apply it to his own life and talk about his mm -hmm. own life a bit more than a lot of other podcasters. He, that's de I mean, he definitely does that. And like one of the reasons I started my podcast is I was curious and I, I really do like him and he's always been nice to me. He's been fi fine to me. I, I forget, you used to go to the um, uh, Luna Lounge on Ludlow Street when he was I did. Uh, emceeing. It, that was a crazy place. In the it's 90s, not there I anymore. would go to that. We probably went at the same time. You'd have to get there like an hour, an hour and a half later if you wanted to see it at a couch, but it was like, Sarah Silverman, Louis C.K., Janine Garofalo. Janine Garofalo, Zach Galifianakis before he could get booked on the Amy late Polar. night show. Polar was there. I mean, it was the, the lineup. I'd, I'd have to think about it now. It was incredible. I remember David Cross being on stage. Um, David Cross, yeah, and he, um, then he did another one. There was a competitor. He did show Twink, Tinkle a show for a while, and then he was doing which was him and I think it was um, John Glazer or John Benjamin. I forget who it was, but he was doing another one. But Luna Lounge was. Um, it was one of those things where it was crazy. I remember the kids in the hall was there. All of them, yeah, they yeah. showed up unannounced. Oh, once. like Michael Ian Black. Yeah, also. Michael Black was there. Yeah, Michael yeah, Black. Yeah, with them. And he was partners with yeah. that other guy who does this wet, hot summer. I, th I, I thought back then he was with, like, I know he was friends with Tom Lennon, but was it Show Walter? Show Walter. Yeah, was yeah, there Michael Show Walter. Yeah, Show Walter was there a lot. Marin was there. There was a time when Marin was just, get, I remember one time. Um, Marin got heckled by one person and he took it really personally. The next week, the person was there and Marin was just like, heckle me, but don't heckle the other person. But he would take things very personal and he was not a, a Do you remember Ross name. Broccoli? I know the name. How do I know that he name? He always used to go up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember him. Dimitri Martin, I remember the first time he did mm -hmm. Luna Lounge and I remember um, nobody knew who he was, certainly. Um, yeah, he, he, there was definitely this incredible um this group because it was like i don't think anybody in america so the internet wasn't they hadn't really taken off that it was just on the cusp no one knew about this show i mean it was very underground i mean you would still have to wait a while outside but it was not like i mean if it was now that was part of the it. experience waiting outside yeah, it really was and you never knew who was going to be on you you really didn't know it was jeff singer and i forget who else it was like another was it naomi steinberg i think the two of them were doing the lineup and at the time and it was like no other show. I mean, wasn't it five bucks to get in? It was like so cheap. Yeah. And you would like go in and it was like when they would go up on stage with this underground. But but it was yeah. this thing though, like people from Comedy Central were there. I was yeah. from, people from HBO were there. They were from, the industry people were going to they would rather go to a show like this that's underground than maybe some of the traditional ones. Listen, they were still going to stand up New York. I mean, Letterman wouldn't come here, but Bob Morden, Robert Morden uh, would personally come to stand up New York below here and watch the stand ups. Um, um, definitely Rob Burnett was doing the same thing. So I mean, they were definitely going to to see the stand ups. But um, I don't I don't think uh, club I mean, I don't think late night management comes to the clubs at all and maybe comedy seller but maybe the seller things have changed i mean it's yeah. just night and day i mean it's it's just a different world we we live in but the the alt they would i i never really liked the term alt comedy that's what they would call it alternative comedy alt comedy i just thought it was comedy it was funny todd barry yeah. would go up a lot too he was yeah, really yeah. good um Jonathan Groff, who was the head writer at Conan, and him would do a two-person thing there was some really good stuff and i don't think any of it was taped or, or kept i mean that i Maybe somebody has some, a couple things, but I mean that was it was such um, an incredible uh, time over there. And and you know you, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about was, mm -hmm. given that the late night show has such a tight format, what do you think of the Eric Andre show? Which is like I feel like it takes the exact format and switches one thing, which is the host is sort of like doesn't give a shit. I loved it. I love <laughs> it. It's the does. best show at all. It of reminded all time. me of Ernie Kovacs playing with the medium. I showed Christine the clips. And the clips I showed Christ Christine were too I, sh I they were too, like they were not the clips I wanted to show her because they wait, were way, way extreme. I forget what they were so extreme that it was like they were not a good example of what the show is. They were so outrageous, over the top, and that, that's the beauty of the show. But I, I mean, Letterman was taking basically Carson and, and, and doing all these things with the conventional show. And I feel like Eric Andre, I mean, I couldn't believe when I saw his show the first time. I mean, I just, I got really excited. I mean, it, I think it's hard to take I, something I that's traditional. Really, yeah. I got really excited as well. So I'll tell you an experiment I yeah. did. And I did this with AJ Jacobs. Yeah. So I want. I figured, okay, this is the late night show format. A spoof 
takes a solid format and changes one thing. So I did the late night show format, but I did it on a subway. Oh, that's all. I and love so, that. So I did a monologue on a subway <laughs> to an unsuspecting train, and yeah. uh, I had a musical guest, like a busker, in the you know right outside the subway. I had a a celebrity guest, which was AJ Jacobs, oh and we were promoting his book. Yeah. And then we did some audience interactions by talking to people in the subway about his book. Uh, where, you know, it's all relative. Were you in a suit? I was not in a suit. But that's okay. I mean, some people when they do the late night shows, I mean, the suit most of the time. But Kimmel, the first Ugh, when he first started, Kimmel didn't have a tie when he first started. Conan, I remember wearing jeans. Leno wore jeans once when he was beginning the Tonight Show. But I still think like that. that I mean, playing with the convention is just. I, that's. But I absolutely. Love it. I remember you telling me about that. And I mentioned it to AJ. We mentioned it about to him when we saw him recently, and he was talking about how how, how much fun it was. Yeah. So man. yeah. And then um, also, you must, you've got to appreciate Space Ghost. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. People, I think there's people that think that's real. I mean, I, I don't know. Like, I mean, there's always. People. I mean, I watched him as a superhero yeah. cartoon. Yes. when I was a kid. Get the clips that match up. It's and then amazing. he does a late night show as yeah. a cartoon. Anything where you can mess with the medium. I mean, it's so hard to do that. I really think Conan definitely was doing stuff that I'd never seen on a late show. Letterman certainly, I mean, was doing stuff I'd never seen. I mean, he did definitely give attribution to Steve Allen. And um, I think the one thing that 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 um, Leno did well that I Colbert did um, really well, which was Leno was getting his behind kicked in the ratings. He was in Johnny Carson's old studio and the audience is far back and there, it's like nosebleed and it's um, it was just not he was having a hard time. Then he went over to 8H. He was here in New York for a week. This was 94. And he was in the Saturday Night Live studio. I think it must have been during the summer or whatever. It's Saturday Night Live. I think they just wrapped the finale. And they did a week. And they had never done this before, but they had a, um, a thrust stage. And they had the audience really close to the stage. And this thrust stage. And... Um, the whole Saturday Night Live, it was just like, at the, it was like a club. It was like doing a club for Leno. And all of them is like this light bulb moment. And they went back and they moved from Studio 1 to 3 and they constructed the whole studio like 8H with the bleachers and the, the seats right up like, like a club. And it really, I mean, I don't think that people know because this was my life for like almost 10 years um, how big a factor is the audience. Like the, for almost all the hosts, the audience, it's a huge issue. And it it, it affects the audience, more, um, the host more than the writing. By far, the host would rather have a good audience than good writing. I guarantee it. And Leno, it was just this different energy when he when he when they went to Studio Three and have the audience close. And then when Colbert took over for Letterman in the Sullivan Theater, they made sure because that was always my issue with the Sullivan Theater at Letterman: too many obstructed view with seats. Mm -hmm. And now I am told that all the seats you they they they, they changed everything, so no none of the seats are obstructed. And I think that they made maybe moved up everything a little bit see, closer. See people. People don't realize how many nuances go into a successful. It's endless. Late night show. And what do you think? It's Col endless. What do you think? And I, and I know we're kind of going into the weeds and all this stuff, but I, no, I, I love, love this. this stuff. Let's keep going. Uh, what do you think Colbert does differently that that you know everyone's got to do something different or they're going to get canceled? So you know uh, if if you if what do you think Colbert does differently f enough that because you know he's himself now like yeah. with the Colbert report he played the a character, character yeah. which was special yeah. now he's like is he like a letterman is he like a like what is he i it's and hard he's great to say what he's so type, talented his, he is like i mean for the first year and a half when he was not doing the um when he was when he was kind of neutral I mean, people were like, so like this show isn't going to work. What is he doing? And those things take a while. I mean, they take at least a year or two to find their voice. And when he started doing the political stuff more, because he was almost like doing the Johnny Carson thing. I think all the hosts were at that time. And just with, with the current administration, things have changed. And that's when he started to become number one. And the guests, I, I noticed, started getting there. Like he has all these people that are working. He's responsible for all these people. They're number one. He's responsible for the network. It's absolutely his work. Um, he is just probably the smartest person I've ever met comedy-wise. He is likable. How, how does he display that? Like, when, when did you see him do something that you were like, oh my gosh, that's really smart? Just the way he could rewrite. He'd be in the in the room rewriting um, right before the show off the top of his head like like this, like the stuff that would come out of his mouth. He does not, um, his mind is not like a, a regular person. His When he would do the Q&A um, for the Colbert Report, he'd always do it out of character. And the stuff that like, I don't know, there's like a minister in the audi audience, he would start going into like quoting scriptures like over and over again, like like that some ministers can't do. Like um, if somebody would mention Lord of the Rings, he he could like, I mean, just like like word by word, his his knowledge, his retention rate, but more off the fly. There, him and Tom Purcell and Allison Silverman in particular over there were like, 
I just, I mean, I'm one of those people, and I think a lot of people is they just need time and like just they they it, it's more just having some time, like even if it's ten minutes to 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 work on it, but they can they they had this skill set where they can just like it can come out of their mouths naturally funny, and it was it was incredible to, to yeah for them how they did that. Do you think I, I you're getting me excited about the late night format? You think a podcast could do a late night show format? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I definitely think there's room to do it. I think so, and I really like the Carson ninety minute. Uh, format. I mean, Carson would have the, uh, a, a TV movie person on. He would have an author on. He would have somebody from Broadway. He would have people um, like Robert Ballard, who, who um, was a professor, of expert on the Titanic. He would have um, the gentleman who did the population of Dr. Paul Ehrlich, population explosion. He would have these, like Gore Vidal. He would talk to all these intellectuals. I mean, they, they, he definitely would dig Dig deep. He had um, what in the '60s? He had was the president of the atheist organization on, and I'm sure NBC didn't want it. But he, listen, NBC needed Carson more than the opposite, and Carson was was running things. I mean, he got full control of the show. He owned the show, which was unheard of, um, by, by 1980. And he was having these people on, and I I think people forget about that. I think people think when they think about Carson, they they think it was like this this show that was awful. Off. I mean, when Robert Kennedy was assassinated, he knew Robert Kennedy. They, they talked on the phone. Robert Kennedy would come to Rockefeller Center and go to his office. And the, at the, when he got, um, they, they canceled it that night. And the first show back was just Carson with Jimmy Breslin, Orson Bean, and like two or three other people. No audience. It was the only time I, I know that they did Carson without an audience. And um, this, the curtain was open. They didn't even show the audience or the set. And it was just them talking about Robert Kennedy. He could get deep when he needed to be. I mean, there was definitely this other side of him that I think people forget where he would talk, definitely talk about the serious issues. But he just, he did not like Nixon, but he just didn't think America back then wanted somebody that takes sides. They wanted, he was, he was uh, his belief was 100%. They wanted to be entertained and they did not want social commentary because his heroes, Jet, like Jack Benny, they wouldn't take sides. I mean, uh, no, Nobody back then really, unless there were definitely like a Mort Saul or something, but like the people that had longevity that were, were, were really um, doing shows like them, they weren't doing it. I mean, Carson was so likable. Maybe he could get away with it. He would definitely take jabs. But you could never tell that guy's politics, but he was definitely um, le- lean left. And so out of, so you're doing the Carson Show podcast. You're doing the Persistence 360 podcast. Yeah. You're having fun with them. I guess you're making money with them. Well, Persistence 360 um, is early on, so hopefully, um, yeah, hopefully that's that that that's the goal. And the Carson podcast, we have had advertisers. We've done Patreon, where people can sign up on Patreon, which has been um, been such a blessing on Patreon advertisers. And we're doing the GoFundMe um, listener pledge drive, so people have been amazing. And like people at all the late night shows listen to to the podcast, which is like it's such a compliment. It never occurred to me that would happen, and that so many people would want to talk like the guests that we've got been able to get. You, you should uh, take all the transcripts, edit yeah. them, make a book, kind of like a written history. Yeah, I think we've talked about it. I mean, Christine and I have talked about it. It's definitely been suggested. I'll talk to you after the podcast. We have a couple and of persistence, ideas. which is a hot topic yeah. among you know business self help yeah. publishing. Like you should do a book deal around that. It is my favorite. It's one of my favorite things in the world. Like like um, like Susan Lacey, who created American Masters, ten years, um, her calling Bob Dylan's manager for 10 years every month to convince him. And finally, after 10 years, it happened. They got Bob Dylan to do Amer- the American Masters. I mean, that those are the stories where people want something and they had they want something so bad. And it's just like, they stick with this vision. And it's like, those are the people that I want to talk. And some people, you know, it, it could some, only take a couple years, but I just, I just want people, the listeners to know that, because I think people looked at, the, tell me if you think this is true. I think a lot of people look at the finished product. They don't see the struggle. I think people listen to your, some people know you really well. They know there was a struggle, but I think that there's other, this other group that maybe discovered your podcast a couple weeks ago, whoever there's just listen, and they think you were fully formed and that you didn't have to struggle. But we both know that was not true. Yeah. I mean, well, Steve, from, since you've arrived even like, which is you a year and a half now. first. No, <laughs> Well, who do you think is the hardest we've had that we had to get that we got? So I know because yeah. from the beginning I was trying for Gary Kasparov, and that yeah. took a couple of years. Oh my gosh, really? He's on my list too. It took a couple of years. Yeah, it took a couple wow. of years because he doesn't really do podcasts. He, yeah, and uh, yeah. I was a James had had him before, but then we had mm-hmm. him. In- Again, recently, yeah. that was no problem. The second time, that's yeah, great yeah. that you got. Once him. he saw how great James well, is, Steve, we were talking, and yeah. it's like Richard Branson and Tony Robbins. Like, I mean, that yeah. is well, not easy. Richard Branson was hard. I was, yeah, say, I Richard would, Branson. But yeah. I think the Supreme Court justice. 
That was amazing. I was, I'm in awe that you guys got it's, her. Like, that's I, a team effort. Again, yeah. his brains, my typing ability. Yeah, but I think yeah. that, but I also think that, yeah, teamwork makes the dream work because she had been made aware of James and was like, hey, this guy's great. I heard some great things about him. And, that's the way, yeah. And so, but maybe if had we never put it in front of her desk, she never would have inquired about it. So, right? And Yeah, like Steve Cohen, when he, when he did Persistence 360, when he was on, relentless and like he like like email mccartney's people taylor swift that it's very unlikely that they're gonna do it and get no he emails but everyone he, he does yeah. when we went to la who was the top person you emailed he well, would email like, like you have to uh, but most her. people would not email for sonia sotomayor and yeah. you guys got yeah. her i mean yeah when steve told me you guys got her or you told me one of the two i was like i just was like like stunt like you guys have pulled off amazing guests you know, so and amazing shows but that like most a lot of people would just be like i'm not gonna ask um, again, I'm just, it's, I don't mean you to be like ask, you, me, you and Dupree, ask, but yeah, if you don't answer it again, but like, it's funny because a friend of mine, Jessica Efron, who's an avid listener of our show, she just was on Jeopardy and she faced a very formidable person and, you know, we, we went to lunch and then we, you know, her dad was even like, this guy's unbelievable. And, um, and I was like, well, it's kind of like that David versus Goliath thing where, you know, people are like, good because David won, you know? So I think it's how you look at it. I mean. You know, things may not have worked out as well for her, but 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 at least she was there and she tried it. And I again, you know, I think that sometimes you get beat and sometimes you lose. And you lose if you don't try. Sometimes you get beat. You asked, and we just were trying. Jay Leno is in town, and we were trying for him. And you know, and they said thanks, Steve. Sorry, you know. And I'm like, well, we'll be back there again. You know, yeah. and um, you we think you to. should do it. And you, you know, it's a, yeah. an interesting strategy that, yeah. like, in when I was in the '90s, my very first company, I was trying to sell it. We weren't yet worth selling; like, we were too too small. But I would put it in front of the people I knew who were buying, and they would all say, "No, no, you know, you're too small." And the key is, and this is what. I, Steve does with guests is that once a month I would send them an update. Here's how we're doing. Here's how we're doing. Here's how we're doing. And then when we were big enough, they they had seen my name so many times and they had a relationship with me that it was easier for them when they were starting to buy more companies. It was easier for them to approach me, even if I still was not ready, than for them to approach a random person they didn't know. You guys all think in the you think long term too because I mean. I know two guys I can think of at the top of my head. One took five years, one took four years, one took five years of me just checking in until they said yes. And I know that like that that, that it just takes a while. You guys, five think, years. What? How long have you been doing? Uh, the- five years. One took me five years. Angie Dickinson took me five years to wow. get. And um, Diane. No, f- that was Diane Cannon. Five. Four was um, Angie Dickinson. Diane Cannon. But like, like I mean, you, you t- need to speak their language. Judy Bloom. All you have to do. You told me the story. You're like, you just tell her. What did you tell me? It was it was genius. Yeah, just that. You spoke the language. Yeah, you basically, why are you going to go on a 66 book tour? You know, when just going on one podcast, my podcast will hit all the people you would hit on that 66 city tour for your book times 10. So and you and made it, it worked. Yeah. You did it. You, you have did to it. hit their agendas. Yeah, they know you did it, and I try to do that too, and just tell them why and why why it make it makes sense. And when I do, when I reach out to a place like IKEA and just polite, I say polite persistence. I you know I can't. I, I definitely want to res- be respectful, but like trying different approaches and just show them that that I'm serious. Like I mean. There's certain guests even for this for persistence where um one person that I'm going to be interviewing soon took uh, I didn't hear back until the fourth time that I got in touch with them it was like once a month but always well, checked in if if you didn't keep up with these people then you'd be the wrong person to host the podcast it's true <laughs> I would have no credibility whatsoever you know yeah. uh, well, well, one thing you know you made me think of when you were talking about Conan's show which is people didn't know who Conan was oh, gosh. And, and so I think we we've been playing around with format yeah. a little bit like we've gone from three episodes a week with guests. To two episodes a week with guests. Now we're doing one episode a week with a guest, and then one episode where it's just yeah. Steve and me talking, so they get to know us. And yeah. I think that's important. I think you should play around with it. Like I'm friendly suggestion, ignore it. I would love to see if, if it's possible to have like a studio audience one time, even if it's like some people. Like we, yeah. Christina, I've gone to see Joel McHale at the Soup. You had to know people, and just having the audience energy is like even if it's a couple people was like really really cool. We've done that a little. Like we did yeah. that with T.J. Miller. Oh yeah, yeah, you did that with T.J. And we did that with William Shatner. Yeah, I thought that was like you taped it. 
downstairs with an audience. And yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say in here in this. Yeah, with Charlemagne. Like, it would or almost or be we like did, uh, Sam Harris. In in the audience was Gary Kasparov and AJ Jacobs. It's amazing. <laughs> but here would have that feel like the Andy Cohen show where it's like. You know, that, that's such a small audience. I just would, I would love to see what that would be if there are people here okay, and people, yeah. but I don't know who am that's I. That's a good idea. I'm not no, going to tell you like how Paul to do Revenzo it. Paul Provenzo in the green Let room. Let me tell you about, oh yeah. Oh God, Paul's a good guy. I want to tell you, Conan, the first season that he was on, they could not fill the studio audience. 190 seats. Wow. And um, I would go to the show. I um, I would go to the show. Um, I got to know people on the show. I was in high school and there'd be empty seats. I mean, he... He, I mean, they canceled the show and they offered it to all these people and they all said no. I think Greg Kinnear, Rosie O'Donnell, they were canceled for like a day and then finally they realized we nobody wants this. We'll give them a little bit. It's getting renewed, I think, every 13 weeks. And then it was just when he made it more about himself. I'll never forget going to that show that summer because he started in September of 93 and then I went that summer and it was like, he finally started to get him and Andy started to get like their voices and get comfortable. And then I watched like a year later, it was like unrecognizable. It just kept getting better and better and playing yeah. with that show, the formats and more of themselves. It was really exciting to watch. I don't know about you when you first started, but like when I first started the Carson podcast, I had never done the interviews. And the voice in my head was like, Mark, you have no, you've never done interviews. You're not qualified to do this. So I'd have that at the, at the, at the very beginning, but I would be talking to like a Dick Cavett or whoever. And I'd be so excited that I knew all these things that I'd talk over them. And like people, my listeners would be like, Mark, stop interrupting your guests. So like now I never do that. I, I mean, I almost no, never no, on the No, no, you should still podcast. do it because look, I just interrupted you. <laughs> uh, I, I, when I first, when I first started the podcast, I, I've only had on guests that I am really fans of, including you, Mark. And uh, I, again, knew enough about them. I was always interrupting them. And my guests and my my listeners at first were tweeting, James, let him talk, let him talk. And I don't know if I got better at interrupting or if the, the listeners got used to it, but now I never get that criticism anymore. And really? I interrupt probably even more. I wish I could do it because like, there's one person I'll tell you about afterwards who you you know person you you've met them. I feel like and, we're gonna do like a secret post podcast afterwards. <laughs> there's like um, so many you know things what? I'll tell I'll, you. I'll, I'll mention who it is. I'll mention <laughs> who it is because I think he'd be okay with it. I was with Christine and I were with Byron uh, Allen. Oh, Allen, uh, one of our studio. favorite guests, Byron yeah. Allen. Byron Allen. If you're gonna talk persistence, if you're gonna talk inspirational, I mean he. It's He's, amazing. Yeah, I mean, Entertainment Studios, he owns the Weather Channel, and Christina and I were in the conference room, and I had gotten so many notes leading up to that, if I don't interrupt your guest, that at one point, I was just, like, not, like, waiting for Byron. I, I wasn't sure if he was done, but then he, we cut this out of the episode, but he was just, like, I think he was, like, acting like it was me and asking him a question. He's, like, like, like the, he was the interviewer, because I just want to make sure he was done with his thought. He was kind of, like, poking fun at me, but I was, like, I'm just not going to get beat up by these iTunes reviews. Um, with people who love the show, but so, but I wish I could do that. That's great that, that you that you figured out the finessing where you can no, in fact, interject now, and interjecting. They say it. Pe people expect me to interrupt them, otherwise they think I haven't prepared. Okay, so <laughs> the, uh, Bob Costas and oh, what were you? And I was gonna say you should talk about Tony Robbins where he tried to kind of disarm. Oh him. yeah, yeah, I want to hear that. Tony Robbins has you know he's like seventeen feet tall and he has so much energy and yeah. he's he's. He's a great guy, and he's 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 banging on the table, making his point, and he's yelling and screaming, and and like at one point he's saying, um, you know, and then uh, President Clinton even called me, you know, to talk about you know what was happening in, with him and the impeachment, and he's going on, and I'm like, I finally had to yell, Tony, stop, and why would a president of the United States call a 31 year old guy to ask for advice? Like, no, and he, like, just stopped. And he was like, oh, uh, yeah, well, and then he answered the question. But uh, wow. uh, yeah, it was hard to interrupt him. Some people are really hard to interrupt. Some people, it's like, some people have, have Ray Dalio was hard to interrupt. Yeah. There are some people that long-winded, and Christine and I will go and post sometimes, and, like, because it's, like, I mean, something that should have been told in, like, 30 seconds is, like, five uh, minutes. But but it's not, it's yeah. not even so much long-winded as... They they have their thought yeah. and they really they'll just block all attempts like they put a mental yeah. zone around them and they'll block all attempts at at anyone interrupting their thought because you're that is like so right there you're 31 what like that is something that I would want to I want to mention Bob Costas who's one of the best interviewers and he in my my opinion when he had later with Bob Costas it was essentially 
the format, the first podcast, because he would tape one-on-one like this, and they would record for whatever, an hour, hour and a half, cut it down into 30 minutes, sometimes do two pieces, but it was an organic conversation like that. And that was, it had this podcast feel. And then he was on HBO and he would have the same thing. It was, um, but I think it was live, but it was, it was him and Vince McMahon and Vince McMahon was really um, at him. I mean, it was like, it was really in his face, but McMahon's like, are you going to keep interrupting me? And, um, and Costas is like, I'm interjecting. I'm not interrupting. <laughs> but Costas is really good at it. And like, come to think of it, like, I mean, like, listen to your podcast. You're, it's, you do it in a way that I don't even like hear it. Like I hear it in my early work and I'm just like, oh gosh. But I think the way I did it was obnoxious because I was like, I'm going to state a fact that I know in my research. So... But no, yeah. what I do is I figure I'm really, it's it's just like you with curiosity. I'm really curious about something. If I don't interrupt and ask this now, you have to. when am I going to have Henry Winkler yeah. right across the table from me again? You but, have to. Yeah, you have to. Yeah, you have to. There's certain things with the curiosity where, I mean, because you're a naturally curious person. I mean, we, I mean, it's one of those things where, yeah, they, that if you have that question, I think you have to do it. But I think, and it's funny when people give me a hard time that are Carson fans because I want to do so much Johnny research, and he would do that too, like 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 you, like me, sometimes, and he would do it. But in the people's eyes, and this happens sometimes, they 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 the way they remember it's not how it was. I mean, the Carson to them, they never was interrupted, and Johnny didn't interrupt. And I'm like, I could make a whole montage of just interruption. He usually but, interrupted with like funny things. He did. He would do that. He and would he was riff. a curious thing. I mean, he would sit down with with people and have serious conversations, and he really the NBC didn't want. The, like a guy talking about population control, they got so much um, negative mail. But it was Carson uh, was going to have who he wanted on. He was not going to say what his stance was. But he was a curious guy. And yeah, he would interject talking. Carl Sagan was one of his favorite guests until, and I can't believe this, in 19, it was 86, I watched the appearance that Carson, there were people that weren't necessarily banned, but they were not welcome on anymore. Carson would go to dinner with Sagan. And very few guests, slim to none, would he go would he go out with guests, but he'd always go out with Sagan because he's this, he, would, he was an astronomy buff and he was a curious guy, Carson. And then Carl Sagan went on and, and, and uh, corrected Johnny on a fact. Really? Somebody told me this. What like fact? That, I forget what it was, but it was something about like like a, like a, like a number or something, like a, how many years with the stars or something. And like somebody told me this, and I'm like, I I don't know if this is true, but yeah, I went to the videotape, and I was like, and it's one of those things because I'll watch people will tell me that I did this on Carson, they wouldn't have me on again, and it's so subtle, but you can just see a, like a glimpse, and you're like, oh, and that I watched it, and you see that him c- correcting Carson, and Carson just kind of makes a joke out of being corrected, but I was like that, if he perceived. Somebody was like, it perceived whether it was true or not and didn't look like somebody was being either, they weren't respectful or being rude in his eyes, even if it wasn't real. And I didn't, I couldn't tell anything. Um, there was a chance that you were gone. I mean, Rickles all, Rickles, even though like that was his act making fun of Johnny, there were definitely, he would get nervous. Like he would go too far sometimes with some of the marriage stuff and Johnny's, um, some of his bad habits um, early when he was in New York more. So it, it's definitely one of those things where I, I watch these things where- yeah. What about Charles Grodin? Grodin. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, he was he was not welcome with Johnny for a little bit. He would go on in character. And that was my whole thing. Him and Morton Downey Jr. were doing going doing a show in character that, I mean, there were people that thought the Morton Downey Jr. thing was real. Um, and then there were people that thought Grodin, people that he was actually being mean to Johnny, where he, that, I mean, he was doing a character. I mean, he was essentially Charles Grodin, and he would make fun of Carson, be um, mean spirited, and they would get Johnny would get mail saying, "Why, why would you have this rude person on your show?" And Carson loved it. The people that were under contract with Carson, that Carson's like, "Please, we want you under contract only our show." Joan Rivers, Charles Grodin, might be one more person. Very, very few people. And Grodin, he did something at Carson, and I couldn't find it. I was doing the research, but I couldn't. I, I was looking at him, and then he wasn't welcome for like a year or two, and he had to do guest hosts, and then they had him back. But there's a bunch of people that Carson perceived were being rude. There's one person that actually, another guy that lives back here that Christine and I read, um, ran into on the street that I'm trying to get on, and he did the show like 30 or 40 times. And he, there was one uh, thing when he was on with Doris Day and he just kept talking to Doris Day on panel on that Carson after 30 or 40 things. He just Carson, they cut to Carson. He's just rolling his eyes. Never allowed back on the show. Huh. Yeah. You, you got to write a book on Carson. Take, oh, okay. take your interviews, write, write <sighs> chapters in the between all the interviews. Is, is like people... No, because there's not that many books on Carson. There aren't. I mean, there's a very... The thing is, is like with this podcast, 
there's all these people that have that friends with his that have never talked publicly. People that worked on the show because I think they know that I'm not trying to do a do a. I, I don't know. I'm not trying to like do an like expose. I'm not. I really am not. Like if somebody is honest and they say stuff, like that's fine. But I'm not trying to dig up dirt. I really am not. Like I mean, yes, he was not a good drinker, especially here in New York. He was not a good husband. He was probably not the greatest father. He got better as it went on. He was a flawed man. Everybody's flawed. He, um, if he perceived or um, that that somebody betrayed him, it was over. I mean, the Joan Rivers thing, and Joan tried so many times to get back. It was over. I mean, that was a thing with him. If he perceived real or not that or it was that 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 was somebody was loyal, it's 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 uh, it was it was done. But um, I don't know if anybody under thirty or thirty five know who, who's who he is. I mean, but you're right. That so there's my not kids a don't lot know. Of out there. What? My kids don't know who he is, even yeah. though he defined all of late night television. It's, somebody told me once, and this is the truth: unless you're Seinfeld or Lucy with constant reruns and syndication, peep the, you you get forgotten pretty quickly. I mean, I yeah. would make the argument that Rosie O'Donnell was the biggest thing in daytime, and then she 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 um. I mean, they begged her. I mean, it was a big wheel wheel barrel of money. I mean, unheard of. And she said no. And then she just stayed out of the public eye for a bunch of years. And then she was on Alec Baldwin's um, show. Um, Here's the thing, and said, I, I, I mean, I don't get recognized anymore from like anybody that's like young, from anybody that's you know twenty or twenty five younger. I forget what she said, but Jim, paraphrasing. But like once you're gone, I mean, they forget pretty quickly. Yeah, one time I went on Ice T's podcast, uh, The Final Level. And I, before the podcast started, I asked Ice T, uh, if you stopped doing every anything at all, like you stopped appearing on TV, you did no podcast, you did no concerts, nothing. How long would it take for people Gosh. to stop thinking about you? And his answer surprised me, but he he answered instantly: six months. It's 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 the it's the craziest thing because I've seen these people that have tried to make comebacks and. Um, yeah, it's 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 extremely hard. I've always like who, name one successful person that left either a, a late night show or daytime show, a host that tried to come back and do their show and succeeded. I mean, everybody's tried to do it, and like Jack Parnan tried it. Um, yeah, it's really really hard. Like Ricky Lake tried to come back. Arsenio tried to come Jay back. Jay Leno. Um, yeah, and his didn't work. I mean, it is really really hard, I mean, especially when somebody l- leaves for a while and then they try to come back. Yeah, Arsenio tried to come back. I uh, mean, Seinfeld with comedians in cars getting coffee. Now that is something he's not doing a sitcom. Um, like he, him and Ray Romano, I, I never. I mean, there's no situation I can ever imagine where they would do a sitcom. I mean, it was completely. It was a different thing. And do, let me tell you something. That show was turned down by. I'm not going to say who, but everybody except for for Crackle. All everybody turned it down, and then when he left Crackle, everybody wanted them those same places that turned him down. I don't think that people really got. What, what, it, what it was, but I mean, what an amazing pivot and I mean, vehicle for, for him. I mean, my parents love it. I mean, he's he definitely um, did something that was a strength of, of his, but I'm talking like personally like coming back on a late night show or a, like a daytime show. Like, I don't know, like Rosie O'Donnell tried to come back on own. I mean, she had a daytime show. She was doing that of Chicago. It didn't get past a season. Um, all I'm saying is that when people decide to leave, it's Jane Pauley leaves the Today Show bunch of years off and she comes back to do a daytime show. The number one show at Nap, Nap, Nap P, they all want it. It's like the number one most popular show that everybody wants and it didn't last a season. And that was like the one show that everyone was like the most confident about. Right, I got one. Tyra Banks, America's Next Top Model to the Tyra Banks show. And she succeeded. Yeah. yeah, she succeeded. But but, but that was, it's di- the talk show she was doing was different though in terms yeah, yeah, of- yeah. Like, It wasn't America's yeah, Next Top Model. But no, no you're format. right. Craig Ferguson is very, um, he's doing movies right now and he's very talented. I don't know if he came back with a late night show, if it would, if it would, um, how it would go. Uh, perhaps it would, great. Chelsea John Handler. St- John Chelsea Stewart Handler, would work. John Stewart, oh my gosh, I think you're right on that. Chelsea Handler went back on Netflix and it, I mean, I I, I, I don't want to comment on it because I hadn't seen the show, but I know it didn't last a season. Um, Joel McHale just did a show on Netflix and it didn't get past a season. He was doing his version. Mm. All I'm saying is, is like lots of talented people, but I think it's hard. That's why I think Leno was so territorial about his Tonight Show that he wanted to stay on because he, there was a, a good chance when he left that show. I mean, he was never going to be able to, uh, to, to that extent, yeah. have an audience. I mean, Leno's a work machine. I mean, it's, he's, I, I mean, I give that guy so much credit. He's really was nice to his staff, accessible to his staff. Um, I've met him a couple of times. Really, really nice man. So, Mark, we have, to, we have to wrap. There's another podcast coming in here. But Mark Malkoff, you've done so many amazing things. Uh, 
people should watch your videos that are still on YouTube. You should listen to your Carson podcast, the Persistence 360 podcast. You should make books out of them. <laughs> you should do more viral homework. videos. You I have lots make, of homework. You should do a reality show and a documentary and a sitcom. There should be a sitcom about a guy who does viral videos <laughs> and how his it always gets <laughs> in the way wife. of his relationship with his wife. Like it's the anniversary, and just to live the, on a plane. And yeah, and the and the plane only is going to book him for the month where the tenth year anniversary is. And they ha- and there's problems. They have to figure it out. I love you, Christine. I have to sleep at celebrities' <laughs> homes, celebrity sleepover. Yeah, but thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, we have the podcast. If people want to check out um, the Persistence Pod, Persistence 360, on my website, markmalkoff.com, and also on iTunes and the Carson Podcast site, Carson Podcast. So I am so flattered I'm here. And the only reason I am here is Mr. Steve Cohen, who I wanted on my podcast, and I, I, I had no idea he was going to bring me here, introduce me to you. And we we hit it off. The first time we talked, it was like it was like an hour and a half. Like I hit, hit pause on my thing and we just were hanging out. And I was like, oh, I have to come back again to interview Steve. Yeah, and yeah. it was so cool. And you were so generous. You're like, uh, you're like, you should be on the podcast. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, no, we had a fun yeah. time. Mark, yeah. don't point the finger, point the thumb. It's because of you. <laughs> Disney, do it's the because Disney. because of you. <laughs> yes. It's yeah. because of you. You have oh, to re- Oh, you're no, nice. No, it all starts with you. And I oh, you guys are very nice. I'm and all so these happy topics to are my favorite topics oh, in the yeah, world. Oh, yeah, this so. was so much fun. I knew you two would hit it off, really. Yeah, that's and what you told now me. Now you only have like a day apart. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This I, is like in, in uh, Step Brothers. When, uh, I think so. Yeah, you, John Riley, or Will Ferrell. Blue, uh... Uh, I might be John O'Reilly, unfortunately. (laughs) Yeah, this was fun. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mark. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so... How do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.